Perfect. The stage is yours, Kim. Perfect. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm Kim Coleman. I'll be your host for the next three hours here at WP Accessibility Day. I've been in the WordPress community for over 15 years. And when I'm not supporting community events like this, I'm working on my membership plugin, Paid Memberships Pro. I'm excited to announce our next session, Excel Accessibility Testing in the CI slash CD process with Maciek Palmowski. Maciek spends his days at Kinsta as a development advocate analyst. After hours, he spends most of his time trying to find interesting news for the WP Owls newsletter or cycling. Please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab in the chat area, and we'll answer them at the end of this session. You can also use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. So that's it for me. We'll welcome Matt Jack to the stream. Hi, Kim. Uh, first of all, Kim, big thanks for pronouncing my name uh, so nicely. I know it's not easy, so kudos for you. Uh, so uh, before I start, I want to start with a small anecdote uh, because uh, when I subscribed for, uh, I submitted my talk for uh, the WP Accessibility Day, I was so sure I submitted for the lightning talk. And I was kind of surprised that, uh, of course, I made a mistake. Uh, so uh, I can say that this will be the accessibility testing as a part of CI the CD process, the extended version. So yeah, let's talk about how to automate it. Uh, as Kim mentioned, my name is Maciek Panowski. I work at Kinsta as a DevRel, but uh, at heart, I am a developer. I always have has been a developer. Uh, so mm, this, I think, brings a bit different perspective uh, for me, uh, especially in this accessibility space, because um, I won't lie, uh, accessibility wasn't a uh, thing that I was interested in for quite a while, but it changed. It changed at some point. First of all, um, there were two reasons uh, that cause that I got interested in accessibility. First of all, I'm a cyclist. And I don't know if you've ever been in Poland, but uh, the infrastructure there isn't the best. So on and on, I had, a, I had to uh, either carry my bike or uh, move from one place to another in, in, in quite different, in, in quite weird manner. Uh, in short, um, it wasn't something easy and I started to understand that okay I am I am a cyclist it's not a big problem for me but for some people it might be also I became a parent and um, again together with my wife we don't have a car we mostly use either uh, public transportation or we are using our bicycles or going on foot so but thanks to using a stroller we we kind of understand how some disabled people have to has to feel using the whole city infrastructure. It's a horrible experience, and it really, really opened my eyes because um, I understood that um, while at some point our kid will stop using the stroller, we don't have to, we we won't have to uh, go around with it uh, all the time, but we never know what will happen tomorrow. Maybe some of us will will, will, will get into an accident or something and uh, will be disabled for the rest of our lives. And we will have to um, live in this infrastructure. And this, this, this was really a true eye-opener for me that it's really worth investing in accessibility uh, because you never know what tomorrow will be. So, uh, so, 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 so this was uh, this were the reason why I got interested in the topic. Uh, so, first, I want to tell a bit about how this how accessibility testing look from a developer perspective. So, uh, the sad news is, especially at those places I had a chance to work with, uh, sadly it doesn't. Uh, it's uh, yeah, just just like that, because um, for more most agencies, 
uh, accessibility is a separate task that is in most cases left on the on the end of uh, of, of, of the whole process uh, also in many companies still don't fully understand who should be responsible for it who should take care of it for some reason i saw that many companies like to push it only on developers and they still don't understand this very important argument that uh, accessibility is provided by everyone in the team every part of the team has to add something from the design through developers through the content team because accessibility is something more than just few lines of code or an overlay or like some companies try to convince us uh also quite often there is this sad argument that we have more important things to do and uh, i'm very happy that uh, at least uh, I see that in Poland there, there is this change that every public site has to go through these WPCAG uh, norms. Uh, and uh, this was the first time when all the, the, where many companies start understanding that accessibility is a must because without it, they won't get the money. So while this is a bit forcing uh, those agency to get interested in accessibility it works so it's good and the constant problem the lack of education i mean um developers has to learn all of their life there are so many new technologies so many new things that appear every day and um i can understand why some of them just don't have the resources the time to continue education in another field. Um, but again, that's why everyone in the team should take care of accessibility thanks to this, uh, like a hive, uh, such an agency or company should learn accessibility just step by step. Or is, I mean, from my perspective, I see that sometimes it's enough to understand the problem just not to pretend that it doesn't exist just to try to know that it's there and it will already be easier to uh, to, to continue with, uh, with with your own education so uh, i mentioned this weird term in the title cicd what does it mean cicd is nothing else than continuous integration slash continuous deployment or development and uh, it's not a tool, it's a methodology of how we work. And uh, while it can be a bit complicated uh, at some point, the whole idea behind this is very simple. It's all about constant testing. So every time we um, create a change in our code base, we are running all the tests that we have. A typical developer would say, okay, so we will be running unit tests, functional tests, and to end tests from different sites, from PHP, from JavaScript. But hmm, why not to add one more test to the equation? Maybe let's add accessibility as one of them because, well, a test is a test. So there, there, there is no difference. And of course, it's also responsible for the build and deploy process. And it's also very important that without passing the test we never will deploy our application or our website to production which would mean that if we would add accessibility testing as a part of this cicd uh, um, as, as part of cicd um, if we will encounter uh, an error from the accessibility point of view we won't push it to production because it's an error and we shouldn't push pages with bugs, right? Uh, what are the problems? First of all, no one is using it. At my previous company, because uh, before Kinsta, I work at Buddy, which develops a CI CD platform, and I was responsible for our uh, for, for for trying to get uh, people from the WordPress space a bit more popular about uh, deployment automation, and uh, I learned that it's not so popular 
especially that WordPress is pushing more and more towards this no-code, low-code approach. Although the big companies, the big agencies uh, are using CI/CD, so uh, yeah, it's here. It's here, just it's not as popular as it should be. Uh, also, many agencies and companies will say that we have more important things to do, which is kind of a weird argument because um, I would make it, we have more important things to do than waste our time on repeating manual actions, but it's their choice, their money. And the uh, last very popular argument, we don't have time which results to we don't have time to automate our tests, but we will have a lot of time to fix everything on production. Their choice. And how we can add accessibility testing to a pipeline? It's very simple. Uh, thanks to CLI tools like XCLI, P Accessibility, or Google Lighthouse, uh, we can test our website just, with, thanks, just by installing it and passing a few arguments, mostly the URL of the website we want to test and some configuration file. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, and this is how a pipeline can look like, a true enormous pipeline. You see, we are running all the tests. We are running PHP stand, PHP unit, integration test, deploying to staging server. Then we are running the XCLI. Then we are running some other tests. And what's important, if any of those tests at some point fails, we will never reach the last step. So transfer files to production. So if there is an error somewhere, it will never reach the production. It's very important. And this is an example how, uh, how an uh, X can return uh, uh, error if, if, if it will find one. For, I was testing the, the quniversity.com and uh, we can see that there was a violation of duplicate ID active with one occurrences. That's it. We, we, have, a, we have a bug, we know where, where to find it and we know that the action failed. So if we would be developing the site, it wouldn't ever reach the, the production until we would fix it. And this is on what we are doing. So what are the biggest pros of automating uh, accessibility testing? First of all, if and the problem is I cannot find this tweet, but I remember that the Q, so the company behind X uh, responded uh, on, on Twitter to me. And they mentioned that uh, we can find about 60% issues that way. That's great. That's the majority of issues there, there are. So amazing. On the other hand, the testing will always, always happen in the background. So every time we will push our change, the tests will run. There is no way uh, that we can prevent it. And on the other hand, we can just push our thing uh, and start doing something else. The test still will happen. Also, it's a great way to get a very quick response whether the app is good to go or not. Of course, let's remember in the 60% of issue that it will find. So I would consider that um, CI CD, that this automatic testing can provide us with, a, let's call it a good enough approach. If it passes, it's good enough, although we still should take care of the rest. And for me, I think this is the most important important thing about uh, this automatic testing. Uh, it can be a true eye opener for many developers because like I mentioned, this testing will happen whether, whether the developer wants it or not. And if at some point uh, such a developer will see that uh, this website has like 100 errors, that's not something good. And uh, But after the initial frustration, uh, yeah, the, there is 100 bugs. We can create tasks. We can start fixing it. And while fixing them, we, we can learn. So if someone didn't ever cared about accessibility, uh, seeing this log full of errors might open, uh, might open some eyes and uh, change the approach towards accessibility. 
of course there is no this uh, automatic testing is not a silver bullet we can only find 60 percent issues that way so there are still 40 percent issues left so this means that no we won't automate everything we still have to hire people that uh that know how to deal with accessibility uh also those checks only happen when we push a code change only then and uh so if we are developing something uh, we are kind of developing it in the dark that's why it's also important to to use other tools i will mention them in in, in a moment uh it's also important to explain why we added uh, those tests because uh, i mentioned there is a huge possibility that if you will run it for the first time your website might not be too accessible especially if you never uh, never set a priority on it and when you get a return of 100 potential errors to fix you might get a bit frustrated you might get mad and this is this is why it's important to to tell why we are doing it why accessibility is important and uh, but yeah this is the role of, uh, of, of 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 the agency of the company that's it but like i mentioned there are also browser tools and probably most of you are using them just a quick example of how X works. Probably most of you uh, use it every day, but just to make sure, so we are just testing the WordPress.org website. And after a few seconds, after pressing uh, the button to scan our uh, our site, uh, we will get the list of all the issues. Uh, we see their their descriptions, where they are located, what to do to solve them beautiful so what is the difference between the those browser browser tools versus ci cd uh, first of all browser tools are much faster to work with because like i mentioned with ci cd tools we have to uh, push a code change to our git repository and then it will run in the background and then we will get the response while with browser tools we just press the button and we already have the response they are also easier to use uh, because you just have to require uh, they, you just have to install an add-on to your browser it's like one or two clicks and you're done while to run a ci cd pipeline in general uh, you require a bit more knowledge uh, so it's much harder to do uh, but on the other hand uh, you don't have to remember about CI/CD tests because they will be the part of the testing suite. They will always happen. And what's important with browser testing, you can skip it. You just—it's just up to you. Will you remember to test your website, or maybe you will start <clears throat> cheating yourself and just push whatever you have with CI/CD tools it's impossible because if it's a test that is a part of the pipeline it will always always run so let's compare them i will show you um, what is the difference in time of running a CI/CD pipeline versus uh testing a, a, a site with x in the browser so on the left we see a, a pipeline and on the right, we see, of course, X. And um, as we see, we already have X ready. And few seconds later, we got uh, this uh, the X the X run that that run in the CI CD pipeline. It took a bit longer. Uh, I would say we would have a chance to drink a small espresso. It a bit depends on the website, uh, but the difference isn't that huge. But it was kind of an unrealistic case because when we will be using, when we will be running a CI CD pipeline, in most cases, uh, we will test everything, not only accessibility. So the more realistic case 
would look like this. Uh, on the right, we still have nothing changed. The X like it was, but now we are running unit tests, uh, functional tests, and accessibility tests. So this takes a bit longer. And as you see, we already could be drinking coffee while waiting for, for, the, for the result. And especially that some CICD pipelines can take about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, we would drink a lot of coffee during this, uh, this, this waiting time. So what should we use, browser or CICD tools? The answer is, I mean, in IT, in most cases, we would use the term, it depends, but not this time. Both, of course, both, because they have a bit different uh, reason to exist. Uh, first of all, we have to remember that browser tools are far superior when it comes to the moment when we are developing something. We can constantly check if our code is correct, if we didn't make a mistake or something like this. CICD tools are perfect, so we can be sure that the code we are pushing to production is correct, that no one skipped something. Also, when we are using a, a browser tool, in most cases, we will be concentrating on this only on the place on which we are working at. So, for example, if we are fixing something on the contact page, we will be only testing the contact page. But it may produce something called regression. So a fix that changed something on contact uh, created an error on some different place of our, our website, let's say on our blog, because we used something from, from, from the contact page. And probably we will miss it using the browser tool. But thanks to the CI CD tool, when we would list multiple pages to test, we would find that, yeah, we caused the regression, we have to fix it. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm really proud to be a, a part of this conference. And uh, if you would have any questions, uh, even after the conference, don't forget to reach me out on Twitter or sign up to my newsletter on newsletter.maciekpalmowski.dev. So are there any questions? Thank you so much, Machak. Um, if you're watching live, you can use the Q&A section to the right of the video stream to ask your questions. Um, I have some of my own, so until I see some coming into the private <laughs> chat, is that okay if I just pick your brain here? <laughs> of course, I'm. Yeah. that's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So for me, I've seen when we have testing like this, it's kind of training our developers to you know, see those issues and then maybe learn and write better code from the start. So could you speak to how that, how you've seen that happen in yourself or other developers that you've worked with, um, having CICD part of the development process? Uh, yes, this is exactly what, because let me say this like this, developers are lazy. I know this from experience because that's why I got into automate into this whole automation proce uh, process because, um, uh, I wanted to save my time. And there are machines that can do things for me. And the same happens here. And at some, because we are lazy, we don't like to fix the same errors over and over and over. That's why we will learn how to, the, those basics of accessibility. In most cases, um, not because we want to learn accessibility, but because we don't want to see this error anymore. Uh, it's, it may be a quite pragmatical approach, but the result counts. We will have an accessible product. And, and on the other hand, the developer won't be frustrated because he will learn that, yes, adding this alternative text to an image wasn't something that difficult. And, and, this, and it's like I won't get a notice that, hey, there is an error in your code. It was that easy. So. So, so yeah, it's, um, I really see that uh, apart from uh, just checking if our application is okay, it's also ab the, about the learning, about this eye opening. So and it works. Oh, that's really good. Um, another question I had, 
um, relates to um, creating those first tests. And um, I know when people have no tests written for their code, whether that's a website, the website code or a plugin code or a theme code, it can be daunting, like where to start. Do you have recommendations for the first places to look at for this? Or um, I may have missed it in the beginning. Are there existing libraries that you can use that kind of Thanks. have some, uh, some scans in place? Most in, in most cases, and this is also the great part about, uh, for example, using the XCLI, you don't have to write any test because it mostly scans your website. Of course, you can at some point start adding your own test, and this is great. But by default, just to check if the website is good enough, just run the XCLI. So there is no additional work when it comes to creating the test, because as you mentioned, uh, when you have a blank slate and at some point someone uh, tells you, now we are testing it, you're like, oh, Oh God, what to do now? I don't know what, how to start. But uh, this is one of those tools when uh, the only problem that you will have is uh, in the worst case, okay, we have 100 errors. What to do now? <laughs> but that's simple. You just ask, add 100 tasks and go step by step. <laughs> do you have recommendations for um, when you run these scans and the code is kind of outside of your control? If it's in a plugin, if it's in a theme, how... Have you found it successful to work with those authors? You know, these are open source products um, often, you would hope. So how have you found success kind of pushing back or requesting the changes that are outside of the website's code itself? Uh, first of all, I'm in, in most cases, I try to limit um, being... Re uh, I try to limit the number of plugins uh, because of uh, I'm kind of a control freak. I always feel better when I am in, in, in full control because uh, there are many cases and this is one, one, one of those when it can be annoying that, um, for example, you are finishing this public website and the only problem is not you, it's the plugin. And uh, of course, uh, in most cases, uh, from, at least from what, what I remember, I was always able to fix everything, at least on the front end. The back end is always uh, a, a bit different uh, part of the of, of the of the equation. And uh, I still think that um, when we talk about accessibility, uh, at least here now in Poland, we only see the front end right now. So we still need some some time to to get. Uh, about the backend, but but still, uh, it is possible. It, it I mean, it's it's also one of the uh, things that differences a good a good company from uh, a good plugin company from a bad one. If they will just say no, we won't fix it. It's impossible. It's just accessibility. It's just a sign that okay, it's a bad plugin. Sorry, I don't want to use you. Yeah, people should be open to hear that feedback and make those changes. Um, I'm sure they aren't often major changes. It's adding simple things to where images are rendered, like you said, to um, form elements and and fixing certain things. So hopefully it's not 100 for the developer, but, you know. <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. Yes, I mean, this is... The thing about accessibility uh, is we have to remember uh, that it's a process. It's a process. It's, 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 it's not a task that we will finish. I mean, I lately see that there are many things, uh, especially in, in the web development, that are a process. We are talking about performance that is constantly changing. We are talking about the general experience, which is also changing. And the part of this experience is, again, accessibility, which is also a process because everything changes everything changes we have access to new hardware we learn things about uh, something that we never knew before and so we have to constantly adapt and this is something really i mean this is really fascinating this is really fascinating because uh, it never will will get boring also the fact of this uh, that i mentioned 60% uh, of issues can be solved in an automatic way i remember that in some documentation from few years ago, we could read about 20, 30%. So this is growing. And 
I also can't wait what will start happening at the moment when we'll start using AI for accessibility testing. Because there are many problems with accessibility that aren't code related. They are about logic, about how we written the text. And this is something we, at the moment, without any AI, can't check because those are just words. But thanks to AI, they are starting to have uh, to have a uh, to have meaning. You mentioned AI. Do you use um, GitHub Copilot in anything? I, I haven't used it, but I don't know if it's helpful for um, I'm, I'm, somebody I'm kind of afraid. Something. You're afraid. I'm kind of afraid, <laughs> and I'm. I I will also be honest. I'm not fully. Uh, I don't fully trust all those big corporations, especially that I know that there is a lawsuit. Uh, they are planning a lawsuit against Copilot about is the open source code uh, used in a way that it should be used. So there are many things. I mean, uh, AI also changed so many things about how we, especially for open source, because we shared our code and now why someone is using it, why someone is earning money without mentioning us. Many inter interesting things. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. I think our moderator had a few questions, so we'll see if, if they come into the private chat here. Um, <laughs> I'm looking back at my notes. <laughs> We mentioned, let's talk about something totally unrelated. You're um, working on the WP Owls newsletter. What got you oh, started yes, in that? You could just share a little, be a little promotional and get some sign up. Oh, <laughs> it, 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 it started in a quite funny way because at some point uh, my wife asked me, hey, maybe we'll start doing a WordPress newsletter. And I'll be honest, I wasn't listening carefully. So I just nodded and said, yeah. Oh, no. And uh, this was the Polish edition that uh, right now has more than 200 issues. So 200 weeks weeks ago, I just nodded without listening. And, uh, and yes, here we are. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's cool. I also work with my partner. I don't know how involved um, your wife is in the newsletter ongoing, but it's fun to work with your spouse, right? <laughs> I mean, we work at most of companies for most of our lives together. Yeah. So uh, now at, at, at Kinsta, this is kind of a, a, a change where, where, where we are working separately. But uh, who knows? Maybe at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I really love working with her. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something normal for me. There you I, go, I right? I think when you haven't done it, you, it feels very foreign to work with your partner. But then when you do, you're like, oh, this is this is how we do things. Yeah, it's, We're good. Yeah. it's great. It's, it's, it's really great. It's, 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 it's always the, per, the, the person you know. And <laughs> and especially that we had all, a, a bit um, our specializations uh, worked really great together because uh, she's a front-end developer and I was mostly a back-end developer. So it was uh, a, a great combo. <laughs> I'll ask this question from our moderator, mm -hmm. Taruk. Um, mm -hmm. It maybe is slightly related to accessibility, but also mm -hmm. your knowledge having been in the WordPress community for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, um, Taruk asks, how, uh, can you tell us how students can be involved in WordPress for a school purpose? Um, and is there a possibility of students working um, together with WordPress without too much knowledge or any suggestions you have about getting into the community um, as a student? Mm -hmm. I think that especially uh, with what is happening right now, this this push toward this no code, low code uh, approach, I think that the WordPress is more accessible to everyone. Because when I started using WordPress, uh, let's be honest, it was most mostly for geeks and nerds. Uh, so, so, so I think that. Uh, WordPress by default got more accessible to everyone. You don't need to have any specialized knowledge to uh, to start building. So uh, the only thing that you need is to the will to learn. So it's it's it, I think it's very it's very simple to start. Uh, then uh, the next step, um, especially after meeting our community, because our WordPress community is uh, is different. It's different, but it's different in a good way. Um, and uh, as I, I would really recommend attending some uh, some some WordCamp to to feel the whole vibe to uh, take part in a contributor day because especially contributor they can uh, open your eyes to find uh, 
to find something that might interest you more in, in the WordPress page. Because I remember while we were organizing a WordCamp in, in, in my city in Łódź, uh, during Contributor Day, one of our uh, biggest problems was to explain people that Contributor Day is not for developers. Contributor Day is for everyone. You can be a translator, a designer, and the whole long list of people uh, of, of roles uh, that can be filled. So if you have this will to learn and you will find something that interests you, that's it. It's really, I, I think that uh, out of all, all the CMSs uh, out there, uh, WordPress is the most friendly to, uh, to start with. Yeah, I would totally agree. I would suggest joining the Make WordPress Slack if you're not a member yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's various teams in there, and it's it's like virtual contributor day all the time. Um, and exactly. there are teams I think that have online, you know, scheduled meetups or just chats in the Slack areas. And and like Machek said, not all developer focused um, ways you can tr exactly. contribute to like education, to documentation, um, just to community efforts in general. So. Um, it can be a busy Slack channel to be a part of. So use that mute and, and only be in the channels or have them active, the ones that you really like to be a part oh, yes. of. Um, yeah. I'm, I, 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 I might channel, be plugins like... channel is a little scary. No. Yeah, yeah. That's that's true. I'm, I made this mistake once and it was like constantly pinging me. And uh, this was okay. Mute, 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 mute. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, but uh, but 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 still, uh, the best and, and, and because, like I said, our community is is, is so different that uh, I think that meeting those people from, from 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 the community is one of the most important things. I mean, it's also uh, a good idea for for schools to to get involved with with other members to organize some show and tells and things like this. I mean, I, I still remember. Uh, how much meeting Alain uh, Chassera from uh, during WordCamp London meant to me. It was, I mean, he is a WordPress rockstar. Rock star. So when you meet someone like this and he helps you finding this bug that you had and everything, it was like amazing. And I, I, I never felt that uh, I'm talking to a rock star. I just felt that yeah, I just talking to a to a friend. That yeah, there's definitely the first you know, time, but... <laughs> through the pandemic, there were people I would reach out to on a Twitter or in the Make Slack and just ask for 15 minutes of their time. And I always found people really friendly and receptive. And um, yeah, there's still a pretty active meetup community also with virtual meetups. So I guess that's mm -hmm. a way to kind of meet some people and get to know things. But I think the return of in-person WordCamps on a broader scale will really help younger people in this community because you've you've been, you know, two years without that face-to-face, -face, without, you know, feeling that energy that we all got to feel for all those years leading up to the pandemic. So um, yeah, I, I think it's probably I, I been a hard the couple of years. WordCamp Europe was one big hug fest. That's it. <laughs> We were just constantly, everyone was hugging each other. And <laughs> Our uh, producer here said that WordCamp EU was amazing. So oh, yeah, was, more votes was, for yeah. that. And I'm sure there'll be more I, I, to come. I really missed it. I Will really you be going to WordCamp it. Asia? No, sadly, sadly yeah. not. Um, at least not this, this, this year, but who knows? I, I really hope to, uh, to visit all those flagship word camps at, at some point because uh, yeah. why not why not <laughs> yeah, for sure oh and i see one more question can you tell us a little more how can one protect their database from your experience um i mean just the regular things having a, a good hosting because it's important having uh, using updated versions of MySQL, MariaDB, not using weak codes. I mean, in general, it's simple. It's I, I, I sometimes feel that uh, it's kind of scary when we think about security, uh, because security is quite simple. It consists of many, many simple things. The amount of them 
sometimes make causes that we make an error we forget about something and it can cause to a bigger tragedy <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, strong passwords for your own WordPress account, um, strong passwords, you know, and most good hosts are going to give you a strong password for if you do have access to log into the hosting environment and to, exactly. to your hosting account directly, um, for sure. And take backups, you know, the best, your best friend is your backups, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And take them and how, how, put them in places other than your web host environment. So have backups for your backups and, and put them everywhere. And what's important, test your backups. Oh, right. Git, uh, I remember GitLab uh, once had this problem. They had backups, but they never tested it. And it turns out they didn't have backups. <laughs> yeah. Can you restore? That is key. That is a super key. Um, we do have a oh. question from Nobird. Mm -hmm. How much time does it usually take to set up a basic CI CD pipeline from scratch, which includes the accessibility testing? without writing the tests. So just mm -hmm. that portion of the pipeline setup. I think that um, if you are not having any experience with it, um, the most basic example that would automate uh, all the build process, deploy, and for example, add this uh, accessibility testing would take, I don't know, Totally few hours. That's it. That's because um, it also will. It, it also depends on which which application will you use because some are a bit more difficult to start with. For example, GitLab CI is at least for me it was always very complicated. And on the other hand, we have those more simple tools like for example Body. Like for example, I think it's also Deploy HQ. Uh, they have the they they have a visual interface, so it's much much uh, much simpler to to start with and uh, using those tools like i said it should take because it's at the beginning it's always a bit trial and error you have to uh, test something so at first always only play around with staging don't risk and i am saying this as a person who once maybe deleted the whole website because he done a small typo in the folder name and uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why you have Control to have... Z, undo. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, so, uh, but but in general, mm, ov overall, I always uh, try to say that when it comes to starting with CI/CD, go step by step, slowly. Start with the continuous delivery deployment part. So first, think only about automating the deployments. That's it. Then start building if you have some node modules or you want to compress your JavaScript. Or, so this is another thing. And at the end, start adding tests. The cool part about accessibility testing, it's like I mentioned, it's simple. It's just running the CLI tool. So you can uh, you can add those no or low configuration tests like accessibility testing, like uh, PHP stand. It's also quite easy, but for, for, for developers. And in the end, you go with those most difficult where you have to write tests. So this whole workflow, creating it, probably can take even years. But it doesn't matter. It's important to just go step by step, have some progress. Because every time you will add this extra step, you will save yourself a lot of time. The more project, the more uh, project on which you are working uh, at, the bigger uh, save of time you'll see. So it's, it's worth it. Have you seen in these teams that it's like an individual person's um, role to be the one that addresses the errors that come up with the accessibility testing in the CICD or how, I guess, depending on team size, it could be the person who does everything or how have you seen that work? Uh, that's, the, the sad part was that in most uh, companies, uh, there was none, and there was just this. Sometimes there was this person uh, who knew about accessibility and was arguing with the rest of the team that, hey, there is something like accessibility, let's do it. I mean, I was constantly arguing with the designers <laughs> because they never understood why it's also their role 
to think about accessibility because we are artists, we create art. No, you are not. Websites aren't art, websites are engineering. It's some, I mean, it can look nice, but still uh, it's engineering. It's not whatever you want to paint. It's like cars, they may look beautiful, but underneath there is an engine, there is a lot of technology and that's it. I love the way you referred to that. That's very true. And and there can be these kind of battles within an organization where some people are more of an advocate, like you said, um, for the accessibility route and, and other people are more protective of their art, you know, but we all want to build functional websites that achieve whatever their goal is. Um, if the goal is to just look pretty, that's one thing. But if it has to be usable, it has to be usable by all of us. So that's exactly. a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and like I said, uh, I... I also think that, uh, and this is again this, this this problem with the lack of education. That um, uh, because I think that still developers are a bit more advanced when it comes to accessibility when the uh, com comparing to design teams. At least in in, in my cases, uh, I I hope that I'm mistaken. Then. But um, because it's like this that for some reason. Many think that these, uh, the developers are are the people responsible for fixing the website to pass the accessibility. It even sounds horrible because it's we are not taking care of accessibility. We are taking care of fixing things to make it make it pass. So it's it's it's, it's a horrible approach. And and the truth the truth is that I really think that the design team has the biggest impact because it's their vision and. Uh, it's not only about the contrast, it's not only about the colors, it's about the general idea. So for example, if we are thinking about using, I don't know, uh, rich videos and, and everything, okay, let's do it, but also think what about accessibility? How will we provide the same content to people who just won't experience the videos? So, and this is not about painting the website. It's about the general ID that stands behind it. So, uh, so, so, so I think that the designers really don't have, uh, don't, don't, don't fully understand how enormous impact they have on, 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 on the website's accessibility. Um, Truk asks, you know, what are the challenges people, what are the highest challenges people face at the beginning? So some of these tests um, you mentioned the, the number text of text on errors. the image is just the number. It can feel overwhelming. Yes, because uh, if you develop the website and never never thought about accessibility, and at some point you will run the test, and uh, I mean, quite quickly when you after the first frustration phase and anger phase, because the 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 they, they, they will be there, they will be present. Uh, you will start just seeing that okay lack of uh, alternative text for images. So we started fixing it and 100 turns into 50. Okay, and now another simple fix. And in the end, it will turn out there are just few more difficult uh, fixes to, to, well, to fix. <laughs> to That's awesome. I, I think I'm gonna wrap it up now. I thank you so much for being with us. Are there any closing remarks that you have? I think all, all of your education, oh, they took them away, Never mind. Sorry, my check. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, thank you for attending this session with this session with Maciek Palmowski. Uh, you can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using our hashtags WPA11Y Day or WPAD2022. Uh, we appreciate if you would go to WPAccessibility.day forward slash feedback to provide your anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentations. Um, you can also enter to win a t-shirt when you're there submitting your feedback. Um, the next session is on designing a web page for the Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, with Ole Goldberg and Anna Ingborg Lynette at 10 a.m. UTC. While you're waiting, you can visit our sponsors page to grab some virtual swag uh, and enter for a chance to win some great prizes. So um, we're going to reset the chat um, and then there'll be new chat available to you uh, for the next session. So I'll see you right here after the break.
Men når han skriver, om jeg skal dele min skærm, så fordi han ikke vil have, at vi sidder sammen. Så må man ligesom have svaret nej, ikke? Welcome back everyone to WordPress Accessibility Day. I'm Kim Coleman and I'm excited to announce our next session, designing a web page for the Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired. 
This is presented by Ole Goldberg and Anna Ingeborg Lynette. Ole is an ICT specialist working on digital accessibility at the Institute for the Blind and Partially Sighted. Anna is a communication and accessibility consultant and has worked at the Danish Institute for the Blind and Partially Sighted, or IBOS, for 10 years. Um, like before, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab of the chat area, um, and we'll answer them at the end of the session. You can also use the ideas section um, in that area to chat with other attendees. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ole and Anna. Hi. Um, yeah, it looks like we're through and everybody's seeing our slides. Thanks for having us. We'll be uh, talking about designing uh, our new web page for the Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, first of all, we're both from the Institute for the Blind and Partially Sighted. Um, which is an institution in from Denmark, um, located in Copenhagen. We're quite an old institution. We're from 1812, 11, sorry, um, and have about 130, 120 uh, employees at, um, at the institute um, with more than 30 specialities. That means ICT consultants, communications personnel, um, and a lot of more specialities. Um, when it comes to comes to Denmark, we are the local knowledge, competence, and rehabilitation center when it comes to vision. Um, so, so we're national. Um, so, what we do is provide um, help for citizens, um, public bodies, municipalities, companies, and vision professionals out there in in Denmark, um, so, so that we can help. We know this target group because they come to us. We have them in house, and we know how they're uh, compensated. We know new, more or less, the newest <laughs> accessibility technologies and so on. So we're a specialist when it comes to how blind and partially sighted use accessibility technology, and how we teach them to use accessibility technology. And. Uh, a bit about us. Yeah, uh, my name is Anna. Uh, I uh, am a communications and accessibility consultant. I've uh, been at the Institute, I think it's almost 11 years now, and I have had many different roles, uh, especially with communications and accessibility. Uh, I have very much experience when it comes to working, you know, with text and content and design and documents in regarding to accessibility. Um, communication is a big part, but I also part time I work with Ole, where we teach and uh, consult external partners about accessibility. Yeah, um, as already said, I'm an ICT specialist. Um, that means I usually work on digital accessibility. Um, screen readers are more or less my major area um, when it comes to digital accessibility. I'm a member of the advisory board for the Agency for Digital Government in Denmark, their um, um, advisory board for web accessibility. Um, I'm a member of uh, the committee that supervises um, how we monitor um, the law when it comes to digital accessibility for uh, the public body websites. And uh, I'm also a member of the Danish Standards Committee uh, called DSS 437. Um, that is a really strange name for the committee that actually does standardization, standardization when it comes to um, digital accessibility. So um, that, that that's more or less that. Yes, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about the target group we have at IBIS. Um, we have primarily, we have uh, two different targets, target groups. Uh, the one is the adults who has a severe visual impairment or blindness. That could be people who are in employment or studying, but it could also be people who are on their way to find a job or to get into a different study. We have student counselor for that. It could also be a person with a visual impairment who is not ready for a job 
or as, um, education, but have other functionality issues besides their vision. And they might need protected employment. It could be daily activities. It could also be permanent or temporary living. The other core group we have are the professionals working in the field of vision, and they work locally all around Denmark. And since we are the most specialized place, they come to us and we do counseling, education. We have courses and knowledge for the professionals. Beside these two main groups, we have a lot of different uh, target groups as well. We have private and public companies. We do a lot of different projects at IBAS where we work together with other businesses. And it could be other professionals. It's a lot from hospitals, people working with the elders. There is also, of course, next of kin. So all in all, we have a lot to consider when designing a web page. We have people who use a lot of assistive aids, so the techni technical part has to be perfect. But we also, is a business that sells, um, so we also need to have a very uh, attractive and visual functioning page. Um, we have uh, taken this slide to show how Ole and I work with accessibility. We always focus on these four different uh, subjects, which we think are equally important when working with accessibility. It's both the, the technical part, um, the content, the design, and of course, the ease of use, which is also very, very important. And this uh, brings me to why are we here today? And we are here today to, to share the practical experience we had about this IBIS web project. And on this slide, I showed you two pictures. And on the left, we have the old IBIS, the old web page. And on the right, we have shown you the new page. The old IBIS, we had more than 3,000 pages, and that was not including all the news. And when we finally changed the page, it had actually run for almost a decade. The web change was supposed to be with the budget, a web company with experienced web people who knew everything about a web process. Uh, me and my communication colleague were supposed to be project leaders. Me and Ole were supposed to be the accessibility watchdogs um, for everything the company didn't overcome. We planned to have a year to do it, six months full time, and it was supposed to be planned and coordinated. But this did not happen, of course. Uh, shortly before we were to start this project, uh, IBUS started another process of trying to become uh, self-governing from being a public place. Um, and uh, because of this would change radically how the web page would work and function, we had to postpone this project. So we had to wait. Uh, this new process was supposed to be investigated and finalized within six months to a year. So we thought we wait. But um, after six months, we could just see that the, the status change just got prolonged and it got prolonged. So every six months, it would happen. Um, it took a lot longer. During, uh, actually, I think it took almost four years before we had the final status. So during these years, we slowly neglected the old web page because we didn't want to put all the money into the system upgrades because in a few months we were to change it. And um, after a few years, the reality hit us. Uh, we had created a web page that was so defaulted and had so many security gaps. It started to get hacking attempts. So our GDPR was deeply, deeply threatened. And the system update was so expensive now that it would eat half the budget for the new page. So this is where the burning platform came in. And um, then we got this idea because Ole is a very skillful technician and you knowing WordPress very well. So we thought, OK, let's make a temporary website. Let's do it on our own. We don't need this web company to do this. Um, we can probably do it in three to four months if we uh, if we hurry. Um, a lot could talk against this, the 3,000 pages. That's a lot to do in three to four months. Um, but we thought, OK, it could be a big bonus. We're going to learn a lot about more about accessibility. We're going to build it from scratch. Um, we could really try it as we go. We wouldn't have the middleman. We could just do it ourselves. Um, and we could get more experience and guide others in the end. So, so we did it and we started. And, and two months after we actually started this project and was well on the way, 
the status of IBIS came to be. Um, but everything was going smooth and it was going well and all the target groups were real pleased. So uh, in the end, this became the final site for the Institute and for the blind. Yeah, um, when it comes to designing something for uh, public use uh, in Denmark, we have some laws we have to follow. These laws are um, uh, an implement national implementation of uh, EU legislation. Um, um, it began in uh, 2018 and it more or less says you have to comply to the European standard when it comes to accessibility. That means compliance with EN 301549, chapter 9, uh, which is about web documents. And uh, most of this document actually just refers to the VCAC 2.1, uh, the AA um, uh, level. So compliance is actually hard, but not impossible. Um, what, what was really interesting about compliance was that when we talked with different web developers out there with the new web uh, design, we, we actually had the, 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 the problem that we knew more than them. I think that Nick stated in the keynote that he also had problems finding uh, um, um, a, a, a place he could go to to get help and, and actually have them do the things right. And, uh, and we had the same problem. So we knew we wanted compliance. We thought we could do that. Um, so um, that, that, was, uh, that was great. One of the few things that's uh, important in, in Denmark and when it comes to EU legislation uh, is you also have uh, to have a web accessibility statement. In Denmark, we have to have it in the a link in the footer and we have to have a smart email that uh, the, the site stash um, VES, and which points to the Danish um, web accessibility statement repository in, um, in, in the public bodies. Um, so, so in there we have des described what, what, what is good, what is not good, and so on. One of the other things that actually is great about the law is there has to be a feedback me mechanism. Um, for us, we have uh, a phone number and we have an email and we really makes it clear that we don't want um, people sending us personal information because that's always a danger when it comes to uh, sending emails, uh, at least for us being uh, in, in the health area. So when it comes to laws and standards, it's pretty clear what we have to do. Um, one of the things that I was happy about when uh, when we had this problem was when it comes to these uh, these kind of things. I'm quite more of a uh, system administrator than a developer, and um, when choosing what you want to build on, I have very great open source tools, and um, that means when you want to build a website you can choose really really standard rock solid foundations we we uh we chose uh, the the more or less standard approach to this linux apache mysql maria db uh, php running on debian um and when we started out we um we used the debian provided package for wordpress which means that is a really old Debian, I believe, 575 something, but it is provided by the operating system. It's provided by Debian. I know they're keeping their eyes on the system uh, when it comes to uh, updates, and I know it plays well with all the other things. So for us, not being professional developers or, uh, or general, more or less, um, just wanting something that was really rock solid, that was a way to go. Um, we have WordPress 6, uh, 6 uh, recently updated yesterday to 6, uh, 6 6.1. Um, on another host minor site we have on the, on the same server actually. So uh, we're learning 
how to do both. Um, but again, this open source, these open source tools provided us a rock solid foundation and a way to stand on the shoulder of the giants who built this, which is pretty amazing. So we added some CSS and some other minor templates and, and so on. Um, and, and the goal for this is actually not to add something. The goal is to do something that is simple, more or less maintenance free, and have as, as clear a back end as we can have, um, and a shiny front end as, as well. So, um, so these are the open source tools we have on the back end. When it comes to the the, the front or or the plugins, we had a, a, a quite quite some problems actually, because m being a very small language area, we have um, we have an issue with a lot of plugins being partially or or not translated to da Danish. Um, we have uh, a problem with many of the plugins that we looked at were not that accessible. Um, but every time we looked at plugins, those were the key points for us. We had to have our users present the content in a language that they understand. That means Danish. And we have to have plugins that are accessible. So we have... Uh, cookie consent, that is a, a law. We have to ask the users for cookies. We would like to have breadcrumbs. Um, that is one of the things Anna will talk about, uh, about, about navigation. Um, we wanted um, accordions also. There is a, a great plugin for that. A sitemap, again, navigation. Um, some, some help with search. We found search was hard. Um, some statistics, and again, for us, um, text-based geeks, we actually like SSH. So um, that is a, a, a plugin for that also. One of the things that we considered, um, not, not that much, but was asked to consider, I remember when we, uh, when we launched the site, a colleague of mine asked, um, I know this great accessibility overlay. And I was, hmm, okay, I'll look at it. And what I found out was it actually broke our compliance it meant that we were actually not accessible, but inaccessible. So I, I chose to ignore the, the request about that, uh, that overlay. Um, our boss actually also asked, oh, I've seen these overlays. They're great, aren't they? And I told him, we're actually breaking compliance. We're actually having a problem presenting accessible content to our users if we use these overlays. So we have not used any overlays we don't want to because we want to do accessibility the right way. And that is actually not by adding glue or extra content. So test. Test. So we uh, we worked really hard at this page. We got every technical backend stuff put together with all the front end uh, content and design as well. So, uh, so we went to the part where we actually wanted to test and test uh, even though we had a really short period of time to do this it was a big priority for us because we think the users are very important um so we started with the with the in-house with all the teams with all our colleagues they got the site and they came with their views and their inputs first in the first edition uh, then we wanted to get the point of view of our target groups so we did a qualitative study where we interviewed different people from our target group. We did the approach that was think out loud test, which meant that we sat with the users and the users got different tasks to, uh, to solve. And while doing so, they were supposed to think out loud what they met and what happened so we could get an understanding of how they were thinking while solving these tasks. This was also combined with uh, a lot of questionnaires to the different groups. So, so this mass together was the testing, testing kit. And I, I want to stress that we can, of course, not generalize anything. I think that the testing we had was about 25. So we can only say what this person did and why he or her did it. But it still gave us very many insights to different things. So, um, 
when uh, when we did the design at this web page we did from the beginning have a lot of focus on uh, alternative ways to get information of course um we wanted to keep it as Ole was saying a very clean and and very simple easy to overcome you saw the old one it was very cluttered um, we, of course, had a lot of focus on our contrast and colors, but even though we are the Institute, we did want to have colors. We wanted to, to be in, uh, in line with our identity, uh, but of course, we wanted to, to reach a triple A. Um, we uh, did a special design. I actually put the picture here on the slide on the right. We have this main menus on the front page and they are basically with the picture and, and the, the text. But then for the people with a vision impairment, we change their box to this black with yellow writing. Um, and we did it, of course, also for the people with the low vision. So it was easier to see, but a lot of our users use so much Zoom that it wasn't primarily for them. It was also a, a design decision to give focus to our area. So people with a vision, when they came in, they quickly could uh, get the code that this is a special place and that we focus on vision. Um, the yellow text on black sent this message that people here need some uh, specialized treatments. And um, we also hope to signal that we are a place that knows very much about this. Another design thing we did was that we wanted to keep all our content in the center of the page. The old uh, website, we had a column to the left, center and to the right, and it could at times be very confusing. So at this side, we really want to keep it simple to have it all in one place and going uh, downwards. The last thing that I brought here today to, to what we thought a lot about when designing this was our tech Photography and, and font. And this is not part of the WCAG, but a thing that we really uh, say often, it's very important to look upon. I have held uh, talks about this subject alone, and I'm not going to get into that here, but I'll just say that it's important to have a focus on the characteristic shapes, the large openings in a font, and that it's a good space. And as I put this uh, a picture of different uh, fonts, uh, a, a word like a, a one and Illinois is a good word to test your typings because it's usually very hard to see the difference between the number one, the large I, the small L, and these words. So, so this is a good tip for something you can test with when choosing your fonts for your pages. And this brings me to um, when we did the testing. Um, what did we change in, in the design? What, what did come to our intention? And as Ole was into this with the navigation, we of course had a lot of ways to navigate the page, but I think we got really, really, um, we just saw how important it actually is with the navigation. Um, I expected, and I know some screen users get in and they use the arrow down to, to look at the page. But in this test, we could also see that they went for the search field or they immediately opened the element list. I had a picture of that here as well in the NVDA screen reader where they, they get all the headings and all the links immediately. So that shows the importance of really writing some good link text and some good headings. Um, they also went for checking page titles. Uh, they found our button, go to content. And they, they have a lot of different strategies to access this page where people with a vision did as expected. They went down, they looked, they found the main menus that we designed. So, so it's very important to have many ways in. The search field, I, I like to say something about. Um, Almost everyone that search uh, used the search field that we we discovered one of the things that we discovered that we did wrong in the beginning was that we actually did gather our content in very long pages. So we had this page for people with a visual impairment and it turned out when they were searching, they got one hit, which basically could be a good thing. It's not a lot to confused with, but the, the pages were so long. So when you were using a screen reader, it was very difficult to find the content within that page. 
Um, whereas we could see that people with a vision had no problems because the colors and uh, the design made it easy to find the different sections. So actually after testing, we split up some pages again. So we got more pages and more search results, but it's easier to access the different contents. Um, but I still think all in all today, I think we have 65 pages on this site compared to the old where we have 3000. So we still um, have focused our content a lot. Um, one more thing that uh, in this page we have, uh, we don't have very many pictures and graphical objects, but after testing, we even had fewer on the sites that were directly targeted people who use assistive aids. So if it doesn't have any meaning, we took it away. So it doesn't make a lot of noise. And the last point where we really changed the designs um, and we will share that uh, experience is that we saw that a lot of the people uh, got corner or stuck uh, when they finished, when it came down to the end of a page and finished the content, where were they to go? So we actually ended up designing a lot of more go back to main page or didn't you find what you were looking for? Go here. Um, and in the end, I, as I put the last picture on this slide, we added it to the top with a, a visual arrow up and showing its link. So if you ended there, you, you got back up again. So basically uh, we, we found more ways to guide the user around. And then we, um, yeah. And then the content part of our website. Um, we did always have a big focus on the easy language. Uh, we have a very complex uh, professional language with a lot of long, complex words. So, of course, we really focused on making the language more uh, accessible and easy to read. We also, all through, have a very big focus on and language use. We believe that you aren't your handicap, but you have one. So uh, we, we make... Um, we make a big effort to write people with a handicap and not handicapped people. Um, but after we uh, tested with some different users, uh, we got more attention points. And uh, some of the testing we did and some of the task was to find some of the uh, employment offers we have for the target groups. But very quickly, we could see they got no hits when trying to find this in the search field because um, this, uh, this uh, subject or area have so many different names. You can write job, profession, it could be work, occupation, employment. And uh, of course, the, the person who was testing it didn't use the same vocabulary as we did. So we get back and all the big areas, we started using a lot of synonyms to find and, and get this into the content. Then also uh, a thing we discovered was this with the page titles and that how um, we editors sometimes can get a bit too creative. Uh, we had a lot of videos, podcasts, and uh, with a lot of good inspiration. And we thought we, we're going to collect this in a page and we call it Find Inspiration. It's brilliant. Uh, but testing, again, we saw that the users didn't find anything because they search on video, they search on podcasts, and no hits. So be specific is another advice. Um, so now we split it up and we have a podcast side and we have a video side and the, crea uh, the creati creativity side, we use it in other places. And then the uh, one more point was that we spend a lot of time guiding our users in the text. Uh, for example, we have this uh, contact our teams and, uh, and in the beginning of that page, we make sure we have text that say, this um, the, the, the content here is written in uh, alphabetical order in three columns so that the users who use Zoom or screen readers uh, know how to search for the information before starting. So, so that is also some small things we do to make it easier. Um, and in the end, I'm just gonna say that make a checklist and give it to your editors. Um, even though we aren't many people here, it's really easy that you forget a small thing, a alternative text, a heading, put it in right, and very slowly it gets all inaccessible again. So that was my last good advice. I think that was it for this. Yeah. Um, so 
when we designed for screen reader users, um, we're, we, we're actually having some issues always because screen reader users are very complex. There are different screen re readers that do different things and in a different way. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a very much difference on how voiceover on the iPhone works compared to, for instance, NVDA or Supernova. Um, and, uh, and one of the things when it comes to that is more or less, even though they're different, they comply to the same things. There are some differences when it comes to which area attributes and so on they, they conform to, um, but more or less, they're okay, all of these. But users have different levels of experience and different ways of doing things. So the complexity here might not actually be in the excessive technology, but also in the, the users. There are different verbosity levels. There are different languages. There are different voices. For instance, um, we have a Danish voice that pronounces some words really, really strange. And you can actually hear on some of our blind users which voice they're using. <laughs> so um, that that's a, that's a complex issue. Not complex as it can't be solved because there are actually some very good guidelines when it comes to accessibility for screen reader users in the VCAC. If you look there, you don't have to be scared. Um, but some of the things when it comes to the users and the way they use the web page are where the problems can start. One of the things we found out was we actually want to help our users. So we made a guide for the users of screen readers. That meant we tried to describe how the pages were built, how are they marked up when it comes to headings, um, are there things they are not used to. One of the things that some of our users were, were not used to were accordions. Um, so we described how they use these accordions, uh, what were the function, there were buttons, maybe headings and so on. Um, they could be folded in and out and so so on. So so giving the users some guidance were key. Um, and one of the things that we actually always discuss more or less is, is it a problem that we have when it comes to accessibility? Is it a technical problem or is it a user problem? Because some of the feedback we get is hard. Uh, for instance, Anna mentioned um, the title attribute. Um, and, and I think, to most part, we, we actually have great titles. Um, but what if the user actually wants to read out the link for a page? Will that give the user some idea where the user is in, on this web page? Not necessarily, but we have users that tried that. So, so that is one of the things we can say. How can we fix this? Is it a user problem? Can we describe to the user how we want them to interact with the web page? Um, but some of the issues we have are actually user issues because using a screen reader is hard. It is complex. So when uh, when we test and when we do some of the tests uh, with screen readers, we keep our focus very much upon the, the, the VCAC because are we perceiving this correctly? Are we understanding this? Um, are we able to operate this? Are we, are we able to have a robust way to do this? Um, because that is uh, that is the, the, the technical way we can catch this. Um, some of the things that are actually hard uh, for sometimes are understanding um, how things will be pronounced, abbreviations, are they correct, are they not? Um, and actually, um, some things are hard even because we are a small language area. That means that, for instance, um, if we want to have an English page, we have to make sure it's marked up correctly. Um, for us, we're not using something like uh, polylang, multipoly, I don't know right now, uh, but um, we have an English template that 
marks up the language in parts. Um, so the 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 the, the heading or, or the the banner, the navigation area, will be in Danish. If the screen reader actually understands how this markup is done, it it will be read out in Danish. And when it comes to the English content, it will switch to the English voice. So so um, that is a uh, VCAG three one one three one two that we're actually trying to be aware of, and um, that is actually one of the things that are really hard when it comes to the the difficulties we're having. That is a uh, language. Um, yeah, time's running. Um, low vision users, we test, of course, when it comes to them. And that is actually really hard because people use different kind of magnification. When it comes to the VCAG, we have uh, text resize. That means we have to be able to uh, um, magnify, not magnify, but uh, resize the, the text to 200%. Um, percent. But that's actually not what our users use. They use full screen magnification, sometimes up to eight times. And that actually means that the area they see of the screen is really, really small. Sometimes they use color filters, color enhancements, um, focus enhancements, that is a big bright yellow arrow or something. And sometimes they use click to read. So they have many ways into using a web page. Um, one of the things that, for instance, Anna talked about was the way we designed the black um, with the yellow text on it, the, 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 the entrance for the low vision users. And um, when you use color enhancements, not inverse colors, but reverse colors, I think it's called in Zoom text, you would get the black to be white but the yellow keeps being yellow. That means the contrast was horrible and is horrible, but it, it is one of the things that actually is hard to, to, uh, to do something about. So, so that, is a, that is an editorial thing that we have to figure out how we want to do that. So low, low vision users, colors and magnifications are actually something that's even harder when, when you ask me than screen reader users. So what have we learned? We have to start from the beginning um, and choose wisely. The fundamentals are hard to change once we have started. Um, it is very, very, very excellent if you could have an accessibility expert at your side, because no matter how good you think the bureau, bureau you have at your side is, they're not that great. Um, so so that's, that's a key point. One of the other key points is content is actually the most important thing. It's not the technical stuff, it is the content. So when the solution is done, when you are more or less secure in the accessibility of the platform, you have to be aware that the content editors will be able to screw this up, train them. Have a starting point, a plan, and work from there. Accessibility is a project. We're not there yet, but we have to uh, keep going but there will never be a finishing line. There will be new standards. There will be new accessible technologies and so on, so on. And as Anna has done, test, test, test. The people we have doing testing with us are actually our goal. They're our treasure because they find the things that we cannot. What would we like to do more? Time-based media is actually something we would like an easy way to do. Um, because that is actually uh, hard. And uh, one of the things with the ESL uh, interpreter is great having that. I know some of our users would love had to have that on our uh, video and uh, time-based media. So an easy way to do that, we would be help. We would be greatly uh, appreciative. Um, we would like more time and effort, put in effort into helping our users, both when it comes to accessibility and usability issues. Um, of course, the the, uh, the editors, editors and co-workers we have, we want them to be even better at accessibility and usability issues. We have a lot of integration problems when it comes to um, some of the platforms. For instance, we use Moodle. We have other different um, platforms that we want to tie in and integrate, and we can do that better. So that is one of the other things we would like to do better. And we would like also to uh, test, test, test. So I think that almost makes it our time. And I will start. 
Thank you so much. No, you did perfect on the time. Absolutely perfect. Oh, and I loved all you. the memes and the graphics in your slides. I was just like, oh, what's the next meme going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to start the Q&A. So if you're watching live, you can still add questions in the chat area or in the Q&A section of the chat area. Um, our first question was, um, what was some of the feedback you received from users who are blind or visually impaired? about the flow of the content. So um, for example, were they searching for links first, previewing headings first, scanning the content? Could you just talk to that a little bit? Um, I think actually the users we had primarily did one of the things. I think the users, they went straight to the search field. Every time they got a new task, they went back and they searched again for new new words or the new thing they were looking for. So they kept doing that in that direction. And it seemed like a lot of the users kind of had their favorite way to do it. So the, the, the persons who wanted to use the element list used that very much to guide the way through in every page and the people used the search field use that. Uh, we didn't see many that switch between all of the different things. I think the user we have that did that the most was the user who used Apple's screen reader voiceover. I think that screen reader has a bit more, um, and Ole knows a lot more about that, but has this more options to, to change between how it searches um, than some of the other screen readers. So, so that's what we saw that it was very, they went for one strategy and they used that, but the, the mass use very different strategies. That it, it is actually a great qu question because as as one that teaches some of our um, our our users how to use a screen reader, it it actually comes as a surprise to me sometimes how people navigate. Um, because one of the things I would really like them to do, and and I I, I wrote the, the 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 help we have to screen reader users. I would really like them to be aware how the content is 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 um, is marked up when it comes to headings. I would like them to know that we have done links right and and so on. Um, but but what we're seeing is actually some people are using uh, a, a something like jaw search, uh, which is actually just searching the the the, the, the raw text, and um, and and not using uh, how how the, the the content is marked up, which is actually strange to me. Um, and and they might not be using something like the elements list or something, but something like voiceovers, uh, content lists, um, and and searching in those are actually a very easy way to do it. So, I think it's um, it's not a one size fits all, but uh, it's it's actually a great great question. And I think the arrow also points back to some of those those of us who teach people how to use screen readers, that we make people more aware of the possibilities they have. Mm -hmm. Because um, what I experience is much content is actually accessible, but the user don't know how to, to do it or how to access it. Um, so so, so that, that is an explanation that they need. That is something that we need to mm. provide for them. I think also some of the users aren't experts. Uh, I also tested with some of, some of our ICT specialists here at IBUS that are blind. Uh, and of course, there's a huge difference testing with a person who actually works with this every day and know the screen reader. They had so many more ways to do it and options compared to an, an ordinary user who I clearly had learned how to do this really well and, and went for that strategy all the way through. So it's a big difference in their experience level as well. Um, I guess on that point of testing, I'm curious if you have any recommendations for finding the right types of people to test um, and that audience of people, because I know that's a challenge. Um, if you you said you know within your own friends and family and the access you have in your organization, do you have any recommendations for people to conduct these types of accessibility user tests um, with their audience? Yeah, I think it's it's really important that you get the, the full width because there we see that it's such a big difference between our coworkers who are so very good at using their assistive technology that you need to find some of the users that aren't that good. But of course, that's, that's the discussion that we also need to help our users because I don't think you should design for the users who are very inexperienced as well 
uh, it's a, as a, to find some middle ground and some issues might be hard for the users who have less experience. But then with the guide we did with for screen readers, we hope to, to lift them up a bit so it doesn't have to design for the lowest, but can, can find some middle ground. I, th I think it's really important that you are aware when testing um, and doing, of course, both manual and automatic testing, both mm. is great, um, that you reach out to the user groups that you have. Um, I think um, I think Nick also said, uh, uh, build it with us, not for us, uh, in mm. the key opening keynote. And, and I think that's a really smart way of saying it because if if you build it for something that you think users would want, you will you will go wrong, um, and and you have to be robust when it comes to having the, this feedback because it will not all be great. Um, but you have to reach out. You have to make sure that your ears are open. I have really big ears, so they should that should be no problem. Um, but but you have to reach out uh, and and you have to be humble when it comes to it. And you have to be willing to want to change um, something. And, and another point is, I think you have to give something to the people when, when you want their help. You, you, uh, you have mm. to, to provide something for them because you're actually, actually, actually wanting them to work for free. That is, that is not that good. So, <laughs> so reach out, be humble. Be great. I agree. I agree completely. Um, this is a question about kind of the secondary benefits of, of this redesign. And um, you focused largely on the accessibility, on streamlining the content. Could you speak to any of, you know, the improvements of other metrics like Core Web Vitals or of just um, analytics and, and how it was optimized and how it's being used now that, that you've got after this huge investment of time to create? Oh, yeah. That that is uh, that is something we we actually argue about daily. Uh, Sorry. So so uh, so yeah. I, I I I might get smacked now. Yeah. I am not interested in in uh, in a lot of those metrics. Um, I know uh, Anna is. Um, I, I am I am probably one of those who, who are saying when it comes to a, a, a bit with a bit of arrogance saying if if I build it they will come. Um, I, I I'm more or less focused on the other the, the other end of the the, the scale. I, I want to build something that's great, so I believe it it will be used. Um, but um, we, our metrics I, I don't know how they are compared to the old page, but but we have metrics, of course. We have metrics, but <laughs> and that's the kind of the I don't think we have enough metrics on this new page. <laughs> uh, with the old page, we had Google Analytics, and I had a lot of different insights, and I could see a lot of different things. And and we actually is is reaching our one year anniversary with this site, and and therefore I really want to win, go down to the metrics again and see how are we doing, what can we see. But the new uh, analytic tool we have it doesn't show as much as the old one so i can see some basic things and i can see we have good results and we had a lot of more visitors than we did before and uh, and stuff like that but i can't see very deeply through that so that is definitely one of the things that i would have wanted to have more more data and we are trying to upgrade that part <laughs> No, I mean, it is a trade-off, but just, just knowing that you've built something that you're very proud of, that you know is so far an improvement from what it was prior to that, I'm sure that the metrics, when you look at them again, you'll just be like, oh, we're yeah. good. And, and that annual check-in might be enough. <laughs> yeah. And people are, are coming and saying good stuff. So we hope that if something is really wrong, people will say it. But we can see we have a lot of visitors, and that's the most important thing. Um, we have a question from our moderator. Other than the visual content um, and the focus on on um, visually impaired or um, limited um, vision, do you also have a category that's focused on learning by audio? We do have, um, I'm not sure this is, but we, we do work a lot with podcasts and, and, and some, uh, as a, to have a lot of our knowledge given in the, and I'm not sure what thing. Um, the the podcast dimension is is very audio. I, mm. I believe that's that's more or less it. Uh, also, we um, 
that is not directly on the main page, but but we we have content when it comes to uh, to learning. We have the Moodle platform where we put content that is ah, okay. time based so, yeah. media, mm. uh, that is text based. Um, we like text mm. um, because it's searchable. It's mm. it's it's uh, it's doable for many of our users. So so um, we're we're not actually so much fo focused on audio it's mm. a great way having mm. the podcast yeah, is a great a way podcasts, but yeah. but 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 text is great for us mm. um at least so so um so it's 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 a bit of both i'm gonna throw this one in really quick this question um you mentioned this guide for screen readers to help them navigate sections like an accordion is that intermixed with the content um where it's presented or is it kind of a standard guide that's um you know persistent across the site but it's a one um, one document yeah. to read. It's 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 one document, uh, okay. and the reason for that is because it would disturb the 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 flow when reading a document where I would intertwine it. Um, but I think it's a good idea. I think that could be something we could work on because you would have to jump back and forth, for instance, or read the the screen reader, screen reader guide to to get the information somewhere else. But I have. In the screen reader guide, integrated the elements that we're wanting to show them. So, so uh, when when the screen reader guide discusses accordions, there is an accordion they can practice. They can see how the, those work. Perfect. We have a couple more questions, but they're telling me to cut off. So I appreciate both of you having been here. Thank you so much, Anna and Ole. I'm sorry I pronounced your name incorrectly in the beginning, but it was a great presentation. And we're all going to go check your website out now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank Thanks you everyone else. Us. Yep. Bye bye. Um, everyone who continues watching, you can continue having your conversations in the chat area or check out our social media and share using the hashtag WPA11Y Day or WPAD2022. Um, while you're on break, we'd appreciate if you would go to WPAccessibility.day forward slash feedback to provide any anonymous feedback you have for Anna and Ola. Um, for our speakers on the presentation. And when you add, add that feedback, you can also enter to win a t-shirt while you're there. Um, our next presentation is how we made Joomla 4 accessible. That'll be at 11 a.m. UTC. Uh, while you're waiting, don't forget to check out our sponsors page. Um, go grab some virtual swag and enter for a chance to win some great prizes. We'll see you right here after the break.
Hello, we're just going to do a quick sound check. Carlos, do you want to say hello? Uh, I am not hearing you. I do feel like I'm getting, I don't know if it's just me, but some definitely white noise. Now I'm muted. I think you're muted. So I also can't hear you, but I think that that's what yes, you're Yes, I'm muted, I'm muted. <laughs> Carlos, eh, mira a ver cuál de los inputs de audio. Vale, porque debes de haber compartido uno que no es el correcto. Hola, ¿me escucháis? Ahora sí. Ah, sorry. Uh, I was with a good microphone, but it was not working. Let me try again. I think this works okay. All right. Um, I'm going to just add your slides real quick. So this is what this will work if you want to test them out. And then we will go back on screen. If this microphone is okay, I can use this. I got rid of this. Can you hear yeah, me okay? Laptop, Mike? I think well, it's, it's okay. My, my earbud. If it's good enough, we'll leave it because the good microphone is not working. I'm not sure why. I think we have to use what we've got. <laughs> yeah. It sounds okay to use the scent. Yeah. Well, okay. uh, Carlos, muchísima suerte que vas a hacerlo super bien. Gracias. Bye for now. Bye, thank Bye. you. Okay, so I think we're all set. So we're going to go off the stream and in just a few minutes, I will put Kim, our host, on an interpreter and then we'll pull you on after they do the introduction. Okay? Sure. Great. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to WordPress Accessibility Day, everyone. I'm Kim Coleman, and I'm excited to announce our next session, my last session as your host, How We Made Joomla 4 Accessible, presented by Carlos Camara. Carlos is a web developer that specializes in Joomla, PrestaShop, WordPress, and Laravel. Carlos has been involved in the Joomla accessibility team since 2017 and was the team leader in 2020. Uh, as a developer, Carlos creates a custom solutions for Joomla, PrestaShop, and WordPress. Um, he also maintains the Joomla podcast, mastermindjoomla.com, and a PrestaShop podcast, prestaradio.com. Uh, please feel free, like before, to add any questions for Car Carlos in the Q&A tab of the chat area, and we'll answer them at the end of this session. You can also use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. So without further ado, here we welcome Carlos Camara. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Uh, I think my camera just can't. Okay. No. Oh, sorry. Well, okay. Uh, how we made you laugh for accessible? I'm sorry, my, my camera just uh, froze, freeze. So let's go with uh, just with my picture. Okay, uh, a quick outline of what we are going to to see on this session. We are going to see a bit about me, although uh, we Kim just made a great presentation, so uh, that will be quick. Uh, we will also do a quick Joomla intro, especially for knowing where what is the project and some uh, key concepts and words that I think will be interesting. Uh, we'll see how accessibility has been into Joomla project since the beginning, but not so uh, easy to to see it, but it's been there. And uh, we will see how we made it till Joomla 4, where one of our flagship in this release is accessibility, actually. And finally, the decisions we have to make, and we will see what's the future for Joomla, and I would like to give a piece of advice to this great community of uh, WordPress. So, all me, I speak PrestaShop, Joomla, and a bit of WordPress. I actually uh, then released uh, a plugin for a customer last last week, so a uh, WordPress plugin. So I know a, a little bit about WordPress, but just from a developer point of view, I'm not. I do not usually build uh, web websites with with WordPress. Anyway, I, I know how to move in the in the WordPress administrator and some key concepts. I am not an accessibility expert either, uh, so I I don't know what I'm doing here, as I am not a WordPress expert and I am not an accessibility expert. But anyway, I'm I'm really interested in in a web for everyone. So. Uh, I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> I have been involved in Joomla governance in some uh, high, higher uh, spheres like the the board, the Joomla board that makes decisions, and also in more practical sphere aspects like the Joomla accessibility team. And finally, um, very important, I am the human of two dogs, and I just became father of my third kid. And also, I like running, so maybe you you may see me in many marathon at your city. So a little bit of Yula politics or Yula history. Yula is actually a fork. Yula uh, was a, a is a fork of a, a content management system uh, called uh, Mambo, which was really popular at that point, and. It was developed by an Australian company called uh, Miro, and they decided to uh, stop doing it open source and doing it uh, property or changing some terms in the in the code. And the core developers of of the of Mambo uh, decided that was not the way to go, and they uh, created this fork uh, to uh, have a on open source content management system because that's how they thought the web should be. Uh, surprisingly, that move was well, and they even got a name, uh, which is the uh, 
Swahili word uh, jumla, which means all together or as a whole. It depends on where you where you look for the translation. I'm not a I do not speak Swahili, so I cannot tell you for sure. Anyway, uh, to create this uh, or to make this happen, they created a, a non-profit organization called Open Source Matters, and this is the legal entity that. Uh, covers EULA in the financial aspects, uh, it protects the EULA copyright, and also they made uh, some high decisions about the structure um, and how the project uh, should be doing. Uh, the board of Open Source Matters is, for by four, uh, is formed by four elected members, presidents, by president, treasurer, and secretary, and uh, working and all the working uh, department leaders of the different uh, working structure of Jula. We have uh, different departments for events. We have a department for production that is mainly the, the core of the code. Uh, we have a department for marketing. We have several departments, okay? And then every leader of these departments uh, from the open source matters board. Also, the departments are split or are divided in teams. Uh, for instance, the Yule accessibility team is part of the production department. Okay. So, a little bit of Yule uh, words. Uh, what you can see here, if you have a screen or you can uh, see my, my slides, is uh, the Yule backend. Okay, because in Yula we have uh, two different applications. Uh, we have uh, the Yula administrator, which is what they called a uh, backend, and it's uh, independent from the uh, what visitors of the site see. That is the Yula uh, front. -end. We call it uh, front. -end. Okay, so uh, in this talk I will try to to name Yula administrator. But at some point, I might say Joomla uh, packet. So sorry for that. <laughs> uh, in Joomla, we also have plugins uh, and widgets. Uh, we call plugins plugins, but for widgets, we use the word modules. Okay, and we also have themes, and for themes, we use the word templates. Okay, but it's basically it's it's the same. In Yula, we have a, a concept which is uh, override. It's a very uh, programming-minded uh, concept, and it means that no matter what a plugin uh, gives you in the front end, okay, in the in the view, you can change it using a specific path to put your changes, and then it changes. Uh, the the output you can like replace what the developer have in mind with your own code and it will work it's just for uh, aesthetics it's just for the structure the html structure and the css of the of what people see uh, in Yula, we also Yula is also a fully featured with interesting extensions uh, the Joomla core has uh, probably everything you need to create a, a, a website, a corporate website with no uh, third party extensions, no third party plugins. Just with Joomla, you can develop uh, a great website. We actually had uh, last, last month uh, a challenge in our magazine, uh, which was how uh, to build a, a website just using Joomla core without uh, any third party uh, plugins. So it's something you, you can do and you can do great things just using Joomla, uh, what Joomla provides. Anyway, even so, we also have uh, components or uh, different extensions, components, libraries, plugins. We have third parties. Uh, and other developers that provide plugins to to Yula to make it uh, richer. Okay. Since the beginning, Yula has 
had accessibility in mind, actually. I was surprised when I started learning about this because, you know, I have been involved in Joomla, have been using Joomla since a number of times, but when you were not aware of accessibility or other aspects, you do not pay that much attention to, to them. And actually, uh, when Joomla split it from Mambo, when Joomla was uh, started, it was basically Mambo code, and it was Joomla 1.0, and there was not that much accessibility features, just the ones that were into Mambo. The first release you can consider a Joomla, 100% Joomla, more or less, is the Joomla 1.5 release. And that release into the Joomla code, uh, Joomla framework, and other aspects of Joomla. And uh, it also came with uh, one uh, template, one theme called Biz. Uh, this uh, theme was uh, a fully uh, accessible theme. It also came with a couple of extra themes, but this one is interesting because it was a fully accessible theme by the standards we had at that moment. Interesting features it had. Uh, it provided a font size selector. It had very good contrast. Uh, at that point, in Jula 1.5, 2008, Jula was uh, showing all the code or creating HTML code still with some tables in it. Our theme developers were still showing tables to a structure to lay out the content, but uh, the big theme had no uh, no tables. It was a fully or uh, very nice, uh, great template. In my opinion, this has one, uh, one problem uh, that made it not everyone like it or not everyone use it. It was a very strident design. It was a very pinky, very violet, purple theme with some bees that were very nice and cartoons. But uh, that makes people thought this is not a serious option for my website. Especially it was a time where everyone wanted a corporate website that was great to sell or to tell how good your company was. This was not the best template for that because of this design that made some people uh, thought it was, not, it was not a serious proposal. Anyway, those developers who were aware of uh, the accessibility features in Biz and who really had uh, accessibility in mind when developing websites uh, still kept using it. And uh, I can tell you that uh, I, one of the uh, Judicial Systems website in Australia, I don't remember exactly what, which one, uh, had exactly this template, this theme installed. And you could recognize some of the layouts and the features, but obviously it has a more sober option for, for colors. It was not so pink. So it was uh, interesting in that, in, that, in that sense, so people could uh, use it, even though it was so so still. One interesting thing of this theme is uh, it was plugged with overrides, like it overrided everything to make it accessible. And it was also a good uh, experiment for uh, theme developers to create their own versions of their themes. Anyway, as I mentioned, it was not the, be the most popular uh, theme for you. After Eula 1.5, we got Eula 2.5 and Eula 3, and those uh, two releases came with this 2 and this 3. These big themes still were accessible, still were uh, nice templates, nice themes in the sense of, of accessibility, but uh, they were more boring. They were not, they, they abandoned the pinky uh, theme, the pink colors, the strident colors, and it made, they made them more sober. 
anyway, they uh, were at that point uh, really hard, or really strong internal efforts in Jula to be compliant with ATAG 2.0. And some people in the UX team, uh, like Angie Rackett, which was the developer of the big templates, were really push pushing for accessibility. One thing I have to mention about Joomla historically is that even though it was an open source system since the beginning, and actually the the really the the reason we have Joomla today is because the developers really wanted it to be open source. Historically, it's not been easy to send changes to Joomla. People who have tried or who tried to contribute in the early uh, 2000 at the beginning of the century we are not very welcome to uh, make changes to the code uh, only the core team in Jula were able to make changes to the CMS uh, we were still using SPN uh, it was not easy we had some communication you could propose changes but you have to send them by email it was not like a very good way of of getting new uh, contributions to the to the project. So uh, there were, in any case, uh, some changes in the project, and uh, at some point they decided to change that, and we moved to GitHub, and now everyone, every user of the internet. <laughs> can submit a pull request, and if it is good enough or if it has no problems, it solves an issue and it's uh, tested correctly, it can be incorporated into Joomla. There is no issue for that. Uh, right now, the, the Joomla production team keeps uh, all the, uh, checking all the code that is uh, submitted into Joomla, but uh, it's much easier to get your changes uh, into the project. Also, this came with lots of changes uh, in the in the project, and we have uh, like lots of politics, uh, political changes. So, at this point, we start at some point we started to think about Jula 4. And I say at some point because uh, Jula 4 has been in development since 2013. Uh, this has been huge. I mean, it's been like more than eight years working in Jula 4. Uh, it, it means that lots of things you uh, planned in 2013 were not did not even make it to 2016 it's like uh, you, the, the standard changes you know how how the web is is so it's like uh, everything was moved and we changed lots of things we made different templates different different themes we made lots of changes and in all this process, since 2013, we changed the structure, the political structure in Jula, and uh, we established the uh, on the Jula the accessibility team was created in 2016. So since 2005 till 2016, we did not have any accessibility uh, team or any anyone uh, in charge of checking accessibility into the project. We only have volunteers who wanted it to be accessible, but we didn't have an accessibility team or a team dedicated to accessibility. But since 2016 till 2019, uh, the new created accessibility team made a huge effort in generating lots of documentation, and raising issues for the new things we were developing for Jula 4 and participating in some in some decisions. 
Uh, before talking about the hard decisions we made, I forgot to mention in this uh, in the introduction that Jula had uh, several themes for the front end, and one of them was Biz. We have uh, talked about a lot about Biz. And for the back end, for Jula administrator, we also have themes, and we have. Historically, we have had at least two themes for the Jula administrator. Uh, one is the default one, which was not uh, created or developed with accessibility in mind. And the other one, which was a simplified version of the first one, which was uh, not fully accessible, but we, we like it to think it was accessible because it was simpler, you know. Uh, anyway, it was like uh, what we thought we had, or what we had until Jula 4. But in Jula 4, we did some some decisions, which uh, some of them were harder because it meant uh, to put lots of people in the same uh, direction. But I think we were the correct one. First of all, we do not need an accessible thing. We do not need an accessible thing for the back for the dual administrator, and we do not need an accessible theme for the public path for the uh, default as a default team. We need that the the one administrator theme we we uh, release and the one front end theme we release are accessible. Full stop. We do not need two themes so people can choose if they want to be accessible or if they like the other designs better. We need to everything that is developed in Joomla to be accessible. So uh, that was the first uh, decision. We work through having just one thing for the backend and one thing for the front end. So and both of them, of course, uh, accessible. So both uh, administ uh, administrator and front end themes are right now accessible. We uh, made them complain with uh, WCAG 2.0, 2.1 level A. And we made it uh, making designers, UX experts to work together with accessibility members raising out the accessibility issues. We had lots of, I mean, this has not been a work of the accessibility team alone. We have made, uh, we have uh, the great, great contributions in the community and that made uh, that we can have uh, both themes, backend and frontend uh, accessible in the higher standards we, we set. We also added some uh, features for Eula 4 like uh, accessibility settings so that when people uh, have an account in your site they can decide if they want to see the the site in monochrome if they want a bigger font size a higher contrast or highlight their links all the links and that is a decision they made in their uh, account settings so uh, they just uh, log in and they have all the settings they they want we also had some nice uh, plugins like the skip to links. And this plugin uh, allows you the skip to uh, button. So when you are uh, navigating a Jula 4 website and you click the tabular, uh, the tabular key, the tab key, you see a skip to menu that automatically detects the structure of your page, your landmarks and uh, points you to or uh, allows you to jump to the landmark you you choose and also one thing that is it's funny uh, we packed eula 4 with an overlay <laughs> i i know they are very controversial and it's okay we agree overlays are not uh, the need or what solve accessibility but we also thought that overlays can help in some cases where uh, users do not have the required uh, ability to, 
to manage a website in or to manage the accessibility settings in their browser or they are in a different browser. So maybe overlays can help at some point to, to some users. So we, we pack Yula with this overlay plugin, which is optional. And we actually uh, discourage people to use it as a replacement for a fully accessible website. But in any case, we, we just think it might be useful at some point. Also, another thing we have been working is making the, oh, we, we have accomplished in Jula 4 is that right now, uh, Jula conforms ATAG 2.0. And we have made easier for people to develop accessible content. We have uh, paid uh, high attention to images when you need to uh, use um, all descriptions. We you, or we have made all description choice uh, a real choice for people so that they need to specifically say no we do not need an alt description for this image and if they do not provide an alt description and they they didn't they do not say that they need an, an alt description they need to add an alt description so it's like we have uh, make we are trying to make it really easier for content editors to to have a, a more accessible website Yula for is packed with a uh, tiny MCE editor. Um, we have added some uh, nice features to make it uh, more accessible. Uh, finally, we have uh, forked a couple of uh, plugins in, the, in GitHub to provide an accessibility tester. So right now in Joomla, when you are writing a, a post, you can click on a test accessibility button and then you will see how accessible is your is the, is the content you are writing. Actually, that, that accessibility tester tests your whole uh, front end, if you want. So it's, it's really nice uh, addition. Also in Eula 4.2, we have added keyboard shortcuts that uh, help will help uh, people to move faster through through the Eula side, make it easier to to go to to make whatever they need. And we are trying to make sure that every new addition we do, uh, we put into Eula is, is accessible. So finally, the future of Eula. We already have plans for Eula 5, but one of the biggest uh, intention, one of our biggest goal is to audit any new addition we do into the core so that uh, whenever a new feature is added, we are sure that it is fully accessible. In Eula, the structure of the uh, plugins and the plugin when you have like lots of settings or you have to manage content in your plugins is uh, it's very standard. It's like uh, very few people try to add their own uh, designs because Yula uh, provides with an easy to use a uh, way to create their views. So they do not need to, to create their own views. And even though we are trying to help uh, or to, 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 be, to be sure that uh, when people uh, add new features into Yula, these are uh, accessible. We want to keep uh, doing improvements in the way people create content in Joomla. There has been recently we have uh, created a new uh, user experience team, and we have a, a tight connection between this team and the Joomla accessibility team, so that we can. Uh, uh, well, I think from my point of view, uh, user experience and accessibility is like the. Is, is probably two two sides of the same coin. You just want people to use your website in the best uh, in the best way possible. So it makes lots of sense to to have uh, a tight relationship between this user experience team and the accessibility team. 
we are committed to uh, develop lots of uh, lots of um, we are uh, committed to develop lots of documentation focus on how to make uh, Joomla or the content you create for Joomla or the plugins you develop for Joomla more accessible. We have a lot of that, but we need to uh, check, edit, and publish the, the new documentation we have about that. So we we really want uh, to have this, this documentation where people know how they can create more accessible uh, features. Also, uh, we want to teach or keep teaching or promoting accessibility uh, between web integrators, people who use Joomla to develop their own websites or their clients' websites. We want to uh, keep raising the voice and making, uh, making our point in accessibility so that they are aware that they need to be uh, to have accessibility in mind when developing our website. And since we, uh, till we now, till right now, we have focus on making Jula uh, accessible for people who visit the website. We have also made it so that Jula can be uh, used to develop this accessible content. We have uh, be, uh, made made it so that uh, Jula can. Uh, be used by everyone to create content so it's accessible to create content and now we really want to make it a uh, Joomla easier to code by people i mean in accessible way for instance i don't know uh, we recently uh, abide to uh, psr12 but psr12 is using uh, tabs instead of spaces or well, maybe we need to to change that because when you are programming spaces are more accessible than tabs uh, but you know we really need to to check on that and i make it even easier to contribute for everyone because as uh, we had in our as we have in our name uh, july is all together and altogether means that everyone needs to be able to create content, to access the content, and also to uh, develop the tools that the content uh, that you are using to write the content. Finally, I want to show you a, a little piece of advice. And wait, I'm mean, gonna okay, here. Okay, uh, I sorry I got the title of this slide with a Spanish saying, and it's in, in Spanish. Well, I, I will just say the translation. I sell tips, and for me, I don't have. So, <laughs> in, in English, you would translate it as "do as I say and not as I do." You know, Jula community is a is that it's a community. I'm not that in, into a WordPress community, so I cannot speak about your community. But in Yula, we, we fight. We fight a lot, verbally. <laughs> we are not, I, I, luckily, we have not uh, physical violence yet. But, uh, you know, we, we have issues as in any community. Uh, we also have uh, tried to solve these issues, but uh, even so, uh, it's hard to keep this community, but that's, that, that does not uh, make, does not, should not make you to stop contributing because people have bad days every day. So when someone tells you something in a different tone that you were expected, expecting and then you got discouraged, that, that is not great. So please keep contributing with accessibility. Also, everything you get new into WordPress, test it. Test it with accessibility in mind. You cannot probably make the 
be the perfect test and you might uh, oversee something, but you can test it. You, WordPress is also uh, open source, it's free software. So you can uh, check the new code, test it and raise the issue so that uh, it can be uh, it can be fixed. And also you have these uh, great events like the Contributors Day where you can uh, work on this kind of stuff. So test any new addition and try to uh, not accept or be very, not, not, not allow any new integration into WordPress that is not accessible because everything developed for a content management system nowadays should be made with accessibility in mind. So please keep doing that. Also, this event is great, it's huge. Keep promoting and teaching accessibility. I, yesterday I was speaking with a friend who, a, 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 develop, a developer friend who uh, was not aware of how obfuscating links is bad for accessibility or how bad it is to have bad contrast. I keep having clients who uh, in their brand uh, design system have uh, inaccessible colors. So color combination. So keep promoting and teaching accessibility for everyone, for developers, for designers, for people writing content, for everyone. Also, do not allow commercial interest to structure tools. I know that at some point we as a community do not have that much uh, strength, but please keep fighting against uh, those uh, decisions that make your system inaccessible. WordPress, I think, has more than 40% of the web or 70% of the web is developed on WordPress. You do have a responsibility on what is happening. So at least when when something is introduced that is not accessible, just rest assured that you have fight again against that. So that is uh, what they think you you at least you you could you could do or what they, I it's not what they think you can do. It's just what they would hope for me to do if I were <laughs> in this community. Uh, and finally, aim for more. There is not a way or a place where you can say WordPress is fully accessible because it is not. There are always issues and you know when working in accessibility, some stuff that is working fine for some users, for other users is a problem because it's making them uh, a painful, a more painful process. So just try to always keep uh, vigilant um, and for more accessible uh, website and more accessible content. And that's all I have. So a big thank you to all of you. A big thank you for the organization who allowed me to give this talk. And a big thank you for all these communities. I have been involved in my local community in WordPress and everything is, is great. So thank you very much for everyone who attended this, this talk to to learn a bit more about how we did in Yula to make it accessible. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, yes, the WordPress community also fights and um, we also need to look out for commercial interests. So your last slide absolutely hit all the marks for, for the WordPress community as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, if you're watching live and you have questions, you can put them into the Q&A section in the chat area. I have a couple to start with. Um, first, Carlos, because your camera's frozen, um, just give me like a heads up or say like, okay, um, to switch back and forth so I don't cut you off when you're responding. Amber asks uh, about your accessibility tester, the JAT, um, that's built in with Joomla. Can you talk more about what it checks for and what the reports look like and how you've improved it over time? Yeah, uh, I'm looking for it. Uh, Jolly, Joomla. Well, uh, Jolly is, uh, we, we call it Jolly because, uh, uh, well, you know, it, it's, 
is a, a pun between the, the letters jungla and uh, and let me go here to, to check it because I think you have a link here. It's out between Jula and Ali, which is the I don't have the Ali here. Okay. Let me check that. Here it is. Jula accessibility checker. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh, I, if you can see my screen, this is basically, it's an overlay, <laughs> but it's not intended for your users. It's intended just for you as a checker of the content. When you uh, load the, I, I think we have a, a demo here. I'm not sure if it is working. No. Well, uh, this was a pre here, examples. Uh, this uh, this is basically how as it was. This was a, a GitHub project uh, we found. It was an accessibility checker by JavaScript, and we uh, contributed to to it uh, so that we removed the jQuery dependence of the project, and then we incorporated it into it. We obviously we we contributed back the these uh, features to the author. Okay, I don't know if they if he uh, added them to the project. But actually, when it was good enough, we introduced it. Whenever you load the, the, your article, your preview, the preview of your article, this overlay loads here, and it informs you of the accessibility errors you can see. It checks, actually, I mean, it's an automated test. So you can expect as much as an automated test goes but it helps you or non-savvy users to not techy users to, to check the accessibility more or less easily. Uh, at least the basic, basic accessibility. Here we have that the taxonomy evolution is, is wrong. It has, or we have uh, different uh, issues. When you hover over the, the danger icon, you see, the image is being used as a link with surrounding text, although the alt attribute should be marked as the color. Well, if, if here are some issues uh, that is checked. Another one, link text may not be descriptive enough out of the context. So the learn more uh, link here is, is also an issue we, we might have when creating this content. Uh, the H4 in this, in this uh, content, uh, Non-consecutive heading level used heading should near skip levels or go from heading two to heading four. This only this this plugin is only shown to uh, or you can configure this to be shown only to authors or people with high uh, permissions on your site. And you can even uh, set some some uh, configuration directly where, from the lift test like checking for the contrast. And then we have here a contrast issue. Uh, you can also check the form levels. I don't think we have any form here. So we can check for three, uh, three level, three A's conformance or for readability. And finally, what well, we can have choose hard dark mode. That's another setting. So basically this is the, the checker. It checks the whole page. And you can even use it when you are not in your articles. It's like you can even check a, a development you are doing, a website that is not about a magazine or you are just creating a corporative website. You can use Joali to test the accessibility or at least the, the basic automated accessibility that it can provide. So that's it, I guess. No, oh, that's great. I, I think Amber was curious whether it was a developer focused tool or for the content creators. And I think we can see in this example, it's, you know, mostly for the content creators. Um, we have a follow up question. Um, how do you as a Joomla community with, I think there are still extensions, almost like our plugin repository with WordPress. How do you um, provide documentation or any testing for the plugins and extensions that are made for Joomla? And, and how do you kind of enforce that and maintain the standard? Yeah, uh, simply we, we cannot. <laughs> uh, 
it's it's not that we do not want. We have made some checks about uh, testing. Well, let me let me go the whole process. Uh, in in Jula, we have these extensions repository. Uh, it's the Jula extensions directory where it, the users can share or they, they submit their their plugins or their extensions. Uh, let's go to any of these. Sure. Uh, yeah, this. And uh, this does not host the page. We just, this is just like a advertisement. It's just a directory who links to the page of the author. Okay. Uh, you do not do download them from Jula. You download from the author page. So uh, this is just like an uh, advertisement, between quotes, uh, for this uh, extension. It's like you need an extension and you can find here whatever you need and then you check with the author. In any case, every extension in this directory need to be or must be uh, free, free software compatible with GPL, exactly as you do in WordPress. WordPress, I think you have higher uh, requirements because you also uh, uh, need the developer to uh, upload the, the plugin to the ESPN or to your ESPN and other stuff. In Jula, we do not do that. But we do check that the uh, plugin is uh, GPL. And also, we do some basic tests, uh, most of them automated. And uh, this test checks for basic security. We check uh, that the extensions do not load external uh, content uh, without uh, checking that. And we, we do some basic uh, checks. But we cannot check accessibility because, as you know, uh, accessibility is not something you can test automatically so easily. We had some plans or we have some ideas of introducing uh, Joali into the testing process because we can we could use Joali to to test this uh, the extensions and, and the result of the extensions, but the problem with this uh, dual extensions is that some of them are very very uh, complex and they generate lots of different views, so it's not so easy to check. So we are discussing how we could make it so that people. Uh, can, uh, I, I don't know, provide some uh, extension or some accessibility manifest or declaration. We do not have a theme directory. I don't know, I think WordPress have a theme directory, but we do not have it. So in that sense, that is probably the most critical part regarding accessibility, we, we cannot check. I guess that that is. No, totally. Yeah, I uh, I would think that the community's uh, focus on accessibility in general, you know, might imply that the extensions themselves carry through that same, you know, spirit and, and focus. Um, so to that end, could you speak to how the uh, focus on accessibility from Joomla from such an early start, you said that it's always been a focus. How do you think that's contributed to the success and, you know, the, the public opinion of the of the CMS? Well, to be honest, I my 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 thoughts about access or my, my impression about how accessibility has helped Jula historical is not not that much. Because I don't think people were or developers were interested in accessibility. I for for me, those involved in accessibility in Jula since 2005 are heroes, <laughs> are complete heroes because they were like fighting against the sea and against everything that was there. So for me, they are they are really heroes, real heroes. And uh, I, I think at that moment, it was not, a, it was a, something extra that you had. And some people who were uh, developing websites for, uh, for public uh, institutions, or public organizations, they might need it, and then they started looking into that. There are some uh, thing providers for Jula that are focused, or they have some accessible uh, themes, and that that is great. But there there are some not that many, so it's it's a pity. But 
commercially, I don't think uh, accessibility has helped in any sense. Said so, I think that right now accessibility is in, in focus. I mean, we are uh, big organizations like WC and all these accessibility um, organizations are working so that the web is more accessible. We have uh, every every month we have an accessibility uh, legal case where uh, someone has to pay lots of money because their website was not accessible. And I hope that accessibility is something that we can uh, we can demand for everyone in the future and obviously for Joomla and for WordPress and Drupal and PrestaShop and all this stuff. Oh, I love that, I love that. Um, we have one quick question, if you could speak to it quickly. How do people get in touch and get involved in the Joomla community? Um, we know where we do this with WordPress, but if you're having an issue with your files or your website or things like that, what, it, what are the best ways to get involved in, and in, immersed in the Joomla community? Well, uh, I think one of the best options, if you if you are having an issue with Yula, I think the best option is going to the forum. You go to yula.org and you will see this nice, uh, a nice top uh, menu. And one of the entries is community and support. And in, under that community and support uh, menu entry, you can see some sub menus. And one of them is the forum, the forum where you can uh, request help or search for help. If you are looking for a more professional help, you can go to the service providers directory uh, under the same menu. And also, if you just want to help or start contributing to a Joomla project, uh, you can go to the uh, volunteers portal, which is also under the community and support menu. So. It's like Perfect. I will go to that community and support menu, and I think it's everything we need. Also, uh, we are you uh, uh, this year we were honored with the Google Summer of Code uh, contribution or, or project, and we had some students working for uh, to develop some uh, some features uh, for Joomla, and. Uh, that's an also also a, a good uh, a good way of starting to contribute to Yula because you get all the benefits of the Google Summer of Code. So if you want to get involved into accessibility, we usually try to have an accessibility project in in our Google Summer of Code project. So that's Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. We have to end it here. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this this session. Um, you can continue chatting or using our hashtags on social media. Um, provide feedback at wpaccessibility.day. Get a free t-shirt. Um, I'm checking out as host. We have Devin Egger coming up next with a presentation on boosting up conversions with accessible e-commerce at 12 uh, UTC. While you're waiting, grab um, some swag at the sponsor pages. Enter to win great prizes. And we'll see you here after the break.
Hello, I've added everyone. Hi. Hello. So we can do a quick sound. Hi. Great. Uh, Lazar, do you want to tilt your camera down a tiny bit? It's not super high, but yeah, that's that's maybe a little better. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. And will you all be sharing your screen? Uh, well, it depends from Anna. Uh, Anna, did you? Well, I would like to share um, Tesco once, but um, you will be sharing much more of your screen anyway. Okay, so I'd like you both to use the present button. I hope yeah. Coda does a button. And <laughs> uh, use the present button to share your screen, and that will put it in the background so I will have it ready. Um, I'll have to add it in and out of the stream, so you'll just need to give me a verbal cue, and then I can okay. add them and click the both present now. It's just uh, uh, so if I share my system audio, uh, the problem is that uh, due to since I don't use headsets, you'll be hearing echo. We just tested this with Joe uh, two or three days ago, so I'm not sure that I'll be able to to share the sound of my screen reader. How bad is the echo? Do you want well, to try it right now? Yes. Yeah, we have a two minutes before we officially need to kick off. So. My lighting keeps changing. That's crazy. Do you hear the screen here? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It does echo, but I don't think that's really bad because the goal of hearing your audio is also so that others actually hear what you experience. I mean, it's not like anyone else has to understand what the screen reader is saying. Exactly. Okay. I don't. Uh, I don't think the echo is an issue. All right. How are you doing, uh, Amber? Yeah, I think it's okay. Um, I think that. Okay. Do you also do I also need to turn on a like speech viewer? So I think that would be helpful. Yes, please. Um, although I will say, are you using NVDA? Yes. Um, speech viewer and NVDA has very very small font size. So now we're getting. Uh, what, what kind of noise is that? What was the noise? I don't Not hear second. any noise. Me too. Not anymore. Um, I, so it, the speech viewer might be okay if you want to turn it on. I think it might be helpful. Um, the only thing I would say is if you... I don't know if the point is more for people to see your current experience. If so, then I would leave the speed where it is. If the point is for people to hear and register, you might want to slow down the screen reader. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop us all out for just one minute, and then we'll come back with Devin. Does everyone? I I think we confirmed sound works. So are we good with that? Sure. Yeah. Is my lighting better now? It's a little dark, but I think it's okay. All right, I'm going to pull everyone out for just a minute. You're on. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Devin Egger. I'll be hosting the last three sessions here. Thanks for joining us. Up next, we've got a awesome presentation that I am very excited for. Boost up conversions with accessible e-commerce. It's going to be uh, presented by Anamika Bovalet, accessibility and possibility advocate, anabovalet.edu. 
and Lazar Bolotovic, blind public speaking coach at Global Speak, and Pichin Neri, designer, speaker, educator, and accessibility advocate at Design for Conversions. Thanks for joining us and looking forward to this next one. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. Hi, <laughs> we're on, we're on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you like me to take the lead, Picha? Uh, yes. Go ahead, Anne. All right. You, you are. You're okay. the best at this. You're the best at this. Oh, oh, oh! But not <laughs> good enough by far. But you know, we're learning all the time, right? So, um, ah, I just hear that. I just read that Devin said you forgot to say things about questions. Devin, would you like to say something about questions? No, okay. Um, I think uh, people can ask questions at the end of the session. So Devin already introduced us. Um, uh, today we are with Lazar, who is a very experienced screen reader user. And we would like to show how you can boost up your conversions by making your web shop accessible or especially why this is so important and that it's not rocket science if you really think about it and this of course has a lot to do with the design and it has a lot to do with coding and content as always um, and one of the things that I would like to achieve today is that by seeing how Lazar experiences web shops when they work or when they don't work that you can see where the glitches really are. And um, it's unfortunate we would have had Antonio Carreras with us today. Um, uh, unfortunately, in the end, something stopped him from being here. We're really sorry. We hope to having, having him on next time. But where the development part goes, I will try to explain as much as I can. Now, um, Lazar is the world's first and only blind speaking coach. He's going to tell okay. some more about his work. Um, and Picha is a wonderful, experienced designer, very strong in typography, which is incredibly important also for accessibility and a very design, uh, experienced designer. And um, she's also one of the people who can tell you that you can really create very colorful, very smashing designs for people who can see. Uh, uh, so that a site will also be attractive to people who are not blind or have visual troubles. Um, and I will say more about what you can do code wise, code -wise and design wise, whereas design is something technical to make yeah. something navigable. Yeah. Did I forget something, Picha, Lazar? No, so the, one yeah. of the reasons why it, you know, it's nice to have you start, Anne, is so that you know you could flatter us so much. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> and so let me just say that you are also an amazing designer, and I am learning so much from you because you're also uh, very code-minded. So you teach me all the time, and I think that you're a very good example for the community at large of someone who really understands design but also understands development, and you always do your best to actually properly get ourselves in the shoes of someone who experiences the web and the world differently from us. Because there's one thing, and, and, and then uh, Lazar, I think you can uh, probably confirm this. It's so interesting how if we, if something is far from our experience, it doesn't exist. I was actually uh, mm. reading about this yesterday. So I don't think, I think there's only, only a few of us have actually an idea of how the web is experienced by someone who uses a screen reader. And I am learning so much from Lazar and, and the experience is really interesting in so many ways. But I, I think that we should go into it now and see because there are so many more observations that we can that will come up as we go through it. Well, the, the thing you just mentioned, uh, Picha, is, is very interesting because um, since I started well, let's say being part of the accessibility community, um, which happened, let's say, on May or April uh, this this year. So I was like shocked, and on, on on one side and on the other hand, 
amazed uh, how people are not aware of the things that are related to using the web and web experience from the perspective of a totally blind and a screen reader user. And uh, ever since my first call uh, with Maya Launcher from, from Belgrade, uh, hopefully she, she is following the stream. Uh, if, if, uh, if, 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 if you are uh, Maya with us, then hello, hello. Yeah, good to, good to <laughs> speak here. Um, so yeah, uh, everyone was amazed. Like, no, we never seen that before. How does it work? But you know, like I have been using the web like this and not it's not only me it's like hundreds of thousands of blind users around like since in my case it's been since 2004 wow. and i don't know for some other different ways so that's natural to me this is how i live so this is what i do every day and for me it's nothing strange so you know like okay yeah. this website is not accessible or it's not the most accessible one on, on, on earth, no problem. Let's try to do something about that. For example, if the web shop is not accessible, uh, I can call someone who is, who, who, who is cited. If that does not work as well, you probably, I can definitely figure it out. So, but yeah, definitely accessibility is a huge topic and I'm happy to, to be here and try to well, open some avenues for, for each of you. Uh, it's so wonderful that you're with us today, Lazar. I'm really grateful that you are. And I'm also so grateful to Maya Lonjar from GoDaddy Pro who, who introduced us all. And um, yeah, I think we're going to have a great session. Now to what you were saying, you know, like that it, it was surprising for you to see that so few people are aware. I was one of those people up until two years ago. Yeah. And this is also yeah. one of the messages I'd love to bring across. People, perfect is the enemy of good. So when you are getting into yeah. accessibility now and you learn like, oh, there is so much to learn, don't be demotivated because of that because you'll see an avalanche of information coming towards you. Just chop it up in small sections and you will be doing fine. Yeah. Exactly. What was that like for you, Pitcha? I mean, we are on a panel. Let's talk about what it was like. So for me, I, I'm the same as you. It's, I've, I started becoming aware of this thing called accessibility. Uh, I mean, fully aware and championing it, a bit like you, like a couple of years. Um, but before then, I mean, I, I used to be just a full-on creative designer. I'm still creative, but I do different things now. So when you're a creative designer, you're actually striving to make things as cryptic as possible often because that's not, you know, that's not what the marketing department asks for. So you, you're trying to be really clever. And on the web, what we need to do is be really, really helpful. It's the opposite. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's why I think it's so valuable that we experience Lazar, and this time we have Lazar, and next time maybe someone who has a different experience because there are so many different ways of experiencing the web, and it's just different. It's all that it is, and I think that's the biggest mentality shift that needs to happen is that there isn't a right way or a wrong way or a normal way, you know, that word. It's just different ways of experiencing. So, uh, and I love the fact, and um, that uh, we decided that we were going to use the Tesco website, didn't we? Yeah. Because you have, uh, an, on, uh, on Anne's site, there's a really useful article on Tesco. Tesco is a, uh, United, is a supermarket in the United Kingdom who um, invested in disability as early as the early 2000s, wasn't it? I think yeah. it was... So, and they, they were already tra trading online. It was already normal. For, I lived in London at the time. It was normal to do your shopping online. Well, relatively normal. It was all normal for me to do your shopping online. But they researched what they needed to do to get accessible. And when they implemented the changes that they needed to make, their sales skyrocketed. And I think the 
return on investment was 37,000 percent and was that yes. was I there? had to I had to I had to run that through a calculator because yeah they invested thirty five thousand pounds and they got thirteen million pounds annual additional turnover and I'm very naive where calculations come from so I would divide thirteen million by by that number minus the investment and I, I thought oh yeah okay that's really cool until I got it into a return on investment ah. calculator and I was like okay. <laughs> This is yes. Absolutely. Now I am I'm insanely happy with this case, and I would give this case to anybody who wants to learn about accessible and accessible web shops because um, we want to demo the site, or Lazar is going to demo that site. How we would use that site because their accessibility efforts have been focused on um, screen reader users very strongly. I can tell. Um, and of course, their content, they're doing things very well. But the great thing, and this is why this is such a fantastic case, we're also going to talk about what they could do more to boost their turnover because they missed a lot of corners. And the site is great. And Lazar is probably going to say, this is fantastic. I could do all my Christmas <laughs> shopping here. Although you would have to move to the UK, I fear, Lazar. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, they could, if they would invest uh, in that again, and if they would invest into the design, it would become accessible in a much, much broader sense, because also um, this is where usability, accessibility, and, uh, and being attractive really, um, because people tend to believe, ah, if it has to be accessible, it can't be visually attractive. It's not true. And I know we have uh, one of the sessions in uh, WP Accessibility Day is about it. Yeah. So, um, Lazar, would you like to, uh, to tell us more about what your experience is like on on uh, Tesco, have you tried to register, or would you like to show us how it works? Well, uh, since we had a quick uh, meeting on uh, Friday, where you basically told me that every uh, that everything should be uh, showed for the first time, <laughs> um, I will just do it. Uh, so basically, yes. Uh, do you, you just... mind if I if I comment in between, so I can uh, comment yes, in between uh, on why yeah. it is? I, I, if you don't mind, I might also butt in because Please. yeah, uh, when when, when I when we see the website. So it's www. Tesco.com with a C. Tesco. So. T for Django. E for e Edward. S for Simon. C for Charlie. C for Charlie. O for open. Okay. Okay, so that's come markets. Super online recipes. Okay. Can you uh, make that full screen? Yes. You see it now? Yes. So yes. for me, subtitling verbally. For anyone who is new to this, what you are hearing, it says you are offline. You're not offline. Oh God! God! No, here is something terrible. Here. So the slider. Yes. Can you pause this for a second? Show this to any client who asks for a slider, please. Yes. It speaks randomly. Rule number one if you want to have great conversion on your website, you expect this to happen. Huh? <laughs> Okay, I will now turn out the speech so you can <laughs> Okay, so there's a few things here. So there's, first of all, I don't know about you, but to me, when I listen to that, 
to the to the screen reader at the speed that Lazar uses, it's it's just extraordinary. I don't even do, when we had that at our, our meeting, Lazar I was like, is this speaking English or is it? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure what language it was. And then I did notice that there was the slider, but I don't think you did. I think you maybe you were already signed in, Lazar, maybe. So well, you didn't handle what, what was the, the trick, but that worked correctly. Maybe they changed something in between. Anyway, uh, yeah, I hear some crackings here. Uh, anyway, yeah, this is what we have now. Okay. So and then we by being possible to do not with the bit. I mean, technically, it is a label. And we can't hear you that well. Yeah, we, we I don't know if it's, yeah. I don't okay. know if it's you, Anne. Try and mute yourself, then we'll check if it's you. Yeah, it is you. Sorry. <laughs> I hear you crackling like crazy. You're fine now. You're fine now. I'm fine now? Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's gone now. So, it's gone. Okay, wonderful. So, there really, even if it is um, uh, coded correctly and it has ARIA labels and all of it. This is actually being over-programmed in my opinion. And even the speed, I mean, for anybody who can see, you can see the speed of this slider is crazy. Now, I don't know anyone who is going to sit at his screen and watch what is on that slider. So this is uh, horrific for people who can see and for people using screen readers and for people with cognitive issues like I do. I am ADHD on steroids every day. This would make me jump out of my skin. So, yeah. And now to a possible solution. People, if you really, really, really wish to um, use something on your page that changes, don't use a slider create a post that changes every two minutes because you are the one who has to entice your potential buyer to return every now and then to come back. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? If you come back the next day and it suddenly says, oh, today we have this. And an hour later, they come back out today and we also have that. You would achieve more by that. Okay, now, Picha, do you have any comments or improvement advice on this one? Yeah, I just just don't do it. I, I'm not diagnosed with, with anything in particular, and I'm motion sick because this slider has been going. And basically, have one call to action. Just decide. Don't, it's, a slider is also indecisive. It means that you're not sure what you want to offer. What's... Here we have now Call of Duty and reducing your risk of type 2 diabetes. Who are you talking to? Who is your audience? It's like they don't know anymore who they want to, to, um, to attract. So as we know that, you know, it's a big part of your acts to just have a one, one clear call to action. You can change it every day if you have more than one uh, type of audience, but don't do this. It, it I what what are you going to convert? It's hardly there long enough for me to actually read and then click on the button. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, Lazar, let's let's go back to your experience. <laughs> well, to be honest, Laza. I I did yeah. not expect this to happen, as I told you. Uh, I did. But, yeah, but anyway, uh, especially because especially when I heard your story, Anne. So. I don't know what to think about this at the moment, but what I can say now that this, if this works like this, like 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 what we what we have seen now, I can be very confident to say that online shopping on this website would be a terrible here. I don't say it would be impossible, uh, but that would be much more uh, much more difficult than than expected. What I can do now is I can uh, show you the website. It's a store. Uh, it's a specially designed store for the blind. They sell um, 
like uh, specially uh, like special aids and equipments. So maybe that can improve the impression, so you can see what's like to be. Yeah, a lot can, of can I like ask? That. Hmm? Yeah, sorry, Anne, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just, I, I'm really curious though to know from you, Laza. Can you skip when you realize that there's a slider that's not even making sense, saying things that make any sense? How easy is it for you to skip it to go to the content that you're interested in? It's very difficult. I don't is know it? if it's I don't know if if it's either possible. We have especially if the slides are changing on every link I clicked, and also depends yeah. on frequency, because uh, in in. in I think it happened on previous events that we tested um, one more website with similar issue. And I can remember that. Yeah, oh yes, I remember that. So now, like one, the, of the reason, one of the reasons I would still like to stay on this website is because there are more things going on. And why, I mean, I really don't mean to hit on Tesco. If anyone from Tesco is watching this mm -hmm. or not, I'm going to send the video to you people. Because Definitely. they did a fantastic job 20 years ago. They enable all of us nowadays to say to customers, well, they the new Nobody 20 years old. You're crackling again, Anne. Let's try again. Okay, let's try. Is this still? Still happening. Really sorry, I have uh, of sea. It's still happening. I don't know why. Try okay. In the meantime, okay. So uh, Anne, I'm gonna say what I think you. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, so you want to still try Tesco? So I guess now the point is, how do you, Lazar? circumvent the, the slider and actually get into the navigation maybe are you able to do that store locator i have to be faster than slides than slide changing right okay Wow. So recipes. 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 I have to be very fast. Okay. Because otherwise it's... So because we were going to ask you to maybe slow the, the screen reader down so that user, for, for uh, now that we've, we've uh, demonstrated how fast you use it, but again, you can't do it because otherwise you can't beat the slider. It's about it's about the pace sliding are changing. And if you ask me uh, what would be the, the best solution, maybe they could just add a simple shortcut at the beginning of the website. Yeah. So I can like press something simple like Alt plus one, and then that would exclude changing those slides. Wow. Mm -hmm. okay. Everything else could stay okay. the same, I would I think. Now, one of the things that I'm here, thank you for that stop right in the beginning. And it's just still not. No. So you were saying here in the chat that, yeah, accessibility is a verb. It does not stop. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hang on. Yeah, it's still, it's like really crackling. Yeah. And. Yeah, you're like sparkling. You're like you're like uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like old records. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you're you're muted. Okay. So um, maybe she can type her comments in the chat, and you can read it to 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 both of us, so we can comment. Yeah. So yes, and you wanna you wanna try and do that, and maybe uh, maybe go out and come in again. Um, I have um, switched. Had, I have switched the connection. That works. Okay. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Great. It was the connection, not my AirPods. Now, what I what I really wanted to say is, um, accessibility is a verb. It means this has been created a long time ago. 
Um, but to me, it feels like it did not. And um, this is what I was trying to say. Keep thinking about how you can evolve your work. And she's now, Lazar, for you, she's now freezed. <laughs> Anne has now freezed. She's Keep frozen up. now. Keep up. She's in Switzerland, so that's uh, apt. Well, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you, Lazar, is yep. I can see at the top of your screen, you you have the uh, cookies notice. Uh, oh, yeah. Did you, you saw that. So uh, I think... Think, I mean, you saw, you saw I, that, I you heard not, that. <laughs> well, look, uh, basically, this is very, very difficult because when you have this slider moving around, everything becomes literally a nightmare. I don't know, right. maybe there is, maybe there is not. But when they change so rapidly, I will tell you that I can't visit this website and I cannot interact with the website properly. Maybe some users could. <laughs> wow. here, in, in my case that's not the, the, the possible at least today so yeah this is what that's we, what incredible we have. yeah but I would be happy uh, to simply have a chat so if anyone from Tesco is here or anyone else who is uh, available to connect us with them I'll be more than happy to chat with them and to show them what happens sure. here so you're not able to even pause the slider there's no way for you to pause the slider is there a button? There is a button, yes. I can see that there is a button. Post called. Where is the button to pause the slide? It's uh, there's a backwards, uh, there's a slide that you're on, uh, dot that signifies which slide you're on, and there's a forwards, and then there's a pause button. Because otherwise, I'm thinking that uh, uh, I think it's very difficult to find this button actually. Right. Amber says, try two tabs. Like to open another tab with this website? No, using the tab key. Okay, I, I'm doing that. Yeah, Tesco Magazine, Delivery Saver, Sign In, Register, Reducing the Risk, Diabetes, Viewing one of three items. Maybe that's a slide. Shop Christmas link. Shop Christmas. Go backward to previous cares. Go forward to next cares. Go forward. And that's it. You're on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but this this solution is a bit. Yeah. Why you just you know just 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 do a quick shortcut. That was click this button. Yeah. So we have a good question, in fact, from from the audience. Uh, that uh, what is the best solution to make a slider accessible if the client insists on it? And they're asking, make it manual or slow down the autoplay significantly. So if you make it manual, I can guarantee that very few people are going to go through it. So what would be your suggestion, Lazar? The shortcut, as you were saying. Yeah, the shortcut at the beginning that would allow me to toggle slider off and on okay so that's the the best solution yeah i think so to make it accessible so basically disabling the slider is making it accessible so that just tells you that a slider just isn't yeah. accessible. <laughs> and really. um i was going to talk about the focus states in this uh, site in general um at a later stage because um for the people who use keyboard navigation uh, we couldn't help you because we couldn't see where you were because the focus state was not visible to us. Oh, yeah, um, that's a different so, layout. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this makes it difficult um, to begin with. So another tip, if you want to increase your conversion, make sure you have a great focus state. Now, one of the dangers in our profession 
is that we assume that we know, everybody knows what focus state actually is. Now, you probably have installed a theme, and then you go to the theme support and say, I don't like those lines around my menu items. How can I remove those? Well, that, dear people, that is your focus state. Focus state is uh, uh, becoming active when you make, uh, when something becomes focusable, links are focusable elements, buttons are focusable elements. And if you do not like the, the lines around uh, a focusable item, then style it and make sure that your styling is accessible, it, that, which means is it has great contrast and that the styling is not interfering with anything else. It just has to be very, very clear because this, of course, is kind of dramatic. People who are depending on a screen reader and then ask someone else, can you please help me? And we can't help because not even us can see where the screen reader is at. So this will boost your conversion. Okay. Yeah. So now that we have managed it past this horrible slider and of course someone asked what is the best solution to make a carousel slider accessible sorry as far as i know there is no comfortable accessible slider and maybe you should tell your client that it's like we go into a shop and there's this bad smell you know someone stepped in duck poop before you or the sewer is bad or whatever and it's not really some conscious thing, but you are in this store and you're standing there and your brain starts churning and it's like, mm, ah, maybe I can get this somewhere else. Yeah, no, I'm not going to stay here. I can do this some other day. Boom, the customer is gone. And this yeah. is the same thing um, with accessible sliders. And of course, you can turn off things like autoplay. But yeah. I sincerely believe if you're asking me, how do I boost conversions in my web shop, the answer would be do not use a slider. But yeah, not using autoplay could be a possible solution. Someone has to be able to skip past something like this really fast. Facebook has a very tiny and uh, well, quality solution for this when you uh -huh. just mentioned autoplay. So uh, on, on, the, on, on page, whether you're using a web browser or a, a, a phone app, so they never play the video if they recognize that the screen mirror is turned on. And uh, as soon as the video starts, uh, you just need to double click and uh, click on unmute. Is this in the, in the Facebook website or is it in the Facebook app? Uh, the, bo both cases. Okay. That's wonderful. Okay. That's really good. Yeah, so, but on LinkedIn, for example, you have to uh, to toggle this setting. Mm -hmm. Wow. So one thing that I'm interested in now that we are finally in, the, the slider has stopped. So can we now see, Laza, whether, you know, if you were to do your Christmas shopping, how difficult yeah. it gets from, from here? Well, let's see what, what we can do. So I pressed... Um, control plus home to the move to move to the beginning of the web page. So you, we use cookies. Okay, let's see if this combo box is accessible here. So select. select combo box, yeah, that works. Okay, Great. we can't see what combo box you're on. Yeah, I can see it. You can see it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the drop down uh, on the top right next door to the search. Club card. Club card. Yeah, you can see oh, it's, okay. it's changing. Yeah. yeah. All right. So technically, how do you make uh, and and uh, technically how do you make this accessible? How do you make a drop down accessible for our audience? So basically, uh, you press in my case, let's say that this is not this is my this is not my first time. Visiting this website, so I press C Select combo box to, to move mm -hmm. to the previous to the next combo box, and mm -hmm. then I press Center to open it, and and uh, the menu should appear. Proceed. 
And then they move down and up. Recipes. Recipes and then press enter. So it says again the recipes. I can press tab. Select combo box recipes. Select required. And it's like select combo box recipes. Search box required. Search button select combo box recipes. And then you probably can press enter. Select combo box recipes. Select required. Search box required. Search button select. Search button select. Menu bar recipes. Menu button. Search button select. And search. Yeah, you're in the search box now. Menu bar recipes. Menu button select. Submenu menu item. Out of menu box recipes. Menu level one. Reducing your risk of accidental disease. Discovery. So enter doesn't help. List of three select combo box collects required recipes. Select combo box recipes collects required. Expanded list recipes. Club card recipes. Select combo box recipes collects required. Search box is required. Search button collects. Menu bar goes to menu button collects. Submenu menu after noon that it reduces your risk of accidental disease. Okay, it sounds like it's. Go next combo box. List of select combo box collects required recipes. Select combo box. Club card. Proceeds. Expanded list proceeds. Select combo box proceeds collects required. So you're on the. Come on, so what you're trying to do is that actually going to select the section, grocery. but yeah, so like, you're on groceries, but if you press enter, it should take you there, and it's not taking you there. There is that what's happening? Yes. Select combo box, okay. club card. Club card. Select combo box, club card. Enter, and it says look, it's selected. Expanded list, club card. Yeah. Combo box, club card. Select required. Expanded list, club card. We can. So we're in another dead end, basically. Okay, so, okay, um, I think we have sufficiently uh, demonstrated that even... Yeah, thank you, even Ant. Across, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, even um, uh, a store, and we haven't even gone through the, to, through the process of trying to register or buy something, is it's even for me as a uh, part-time keyboard user, I have an information in my right arm, which enforces me to, to navigate sites by keyboard. Also for me, this site was an incredible challenge. So and that's the same, like you're going into, into a store and um, everything is on the top shelf and you can't reach it. So making your site accessible, your web shop accessible, will boost conversions in general. Where are yeah, you going now, Lazar? We're not able to, to make, to do anything here. So recipes, it sounds like it's selected, no? Yeah, it is selected. Yeah, yeah. so basically, here is a trick. You have to open the combo box, that happens, and then press Alt plus down arrow, this right. is an NVDA command to expand the combo box. Recipes. Club card. And then you can, let's say, club card. Select combo box, club card, collect required. It should be selected now. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah so this is, this is how it works here. So this combo box is accessible, I would say, uh, with a bit of screen reader knowledge. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. That's, that's Azar a, that's grew a, up with it. Huh? Sorry, sorry, Emma. That's that's very um, a, like triggering question for me. What are the accessibility criteria? Because I'm quite sure that after we disabled slides and we were able to, um, you know, select the recipes or to use combo box, okay, with with a bit of knowledge, um, the, this website is pretty much accessible. I mean, I could order from yeah. here somehow. Um, mm -hmm. What is the criteria when we well, say this is accessible or this is not? Well, it's, <laughs> that's um, that's quite a number of, of criteria, um, and that would of course be for you to use it. It would be it should have it should be usable. I'm uh, sorry. Is there someone here in the background? No, no, no. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Just a second. So, so you you feel like now that you got, but don't you feel, Lazar, that you were made to go through unnecessarily, you know, sort of rings of fire in order <laughs> yeah, to get yeah, to a point where you? If, if I would be on my own, so let's say that I'm, I would never. So first, I don't think I would be able to disable the slide. Right, and also, yeah. why would you? You just go somewhere else. Definitely, yeah. But combo box is quite doable. I think I would, yeah, I would, because I, I had this, those cases, but disabling the slide would not be possible without site assistance. Right, there you go. 
So yeah. that's quite, that's extraordinary. So, yeah. Yes. Now, I, I really, as much as I love your question, Lazar, I yep. think if we get into what kind of criteria would make a site accessible, I think all of WP Accessibility Day is about that. And there is tons of information to find about it um, and to share about it. Um, but I think that the main goal of today is actually to talk about how web shops can do better to talk okay. to address more people. And of course, being accessible to anybody is one of the most important things. And it's like, I always find it difficult, you know, uh, when I speak to people who are fully blind, like you are, because we're talking about, yeah, you have to make it visually attractive. And to you, that's <laughs> like, yeah, sure. I don't know what you're talking about, you know? Um, yeah. And I think I would like to compare that to smell. You know, if you're passing by three restaurants and they are all selling the same dishes and restaurant number one doesn't really smell that good, you're going to walk by. And if in restaurant number two with the same kind of menu has a lot of noise, you don't want to be sitting there. Nobody does. And then you come at the third restaurant and there is nice background music and the smells from the kitchen are delicious. That's where people go and that's where they leave their money. Yeah. So I think that now it would be really interesting to see Lazar's favorite site because I think that brings out the the quest the you know a very interesting aspect of it that we commented on. So I I think it would be really great to see that now, Lazar. Your favorite sites to show. All right. So is it the store or another one? The I can't remember uh, which one was it. And do you remember the, the one that you feel like is the most wonderfully accessible site for you? The and Braille we store. Had... Oh yeah, the Braille I showed store, that yes. on, on the previous session. So sorry if if it will be if if you are going to hear and see the same thing twice for those who are watching this. So that's a blind help project with no there is no doubt. Visioning a brighter tomorrow through the lens of technology. Good afternoon. And then there is a search. search. No next combo box. Okay, see, no next combo box. Okay, e. Search edit. No next edit field. No next edit field. Software. 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 Check out this combo box. I press C. And I press enter. Category combo box. Activate for Microsoft products. Activate for Microsoft products. CD DVD tools. Compression and archiving. Super easy. File sharing. Expanded list file sharing. Category combo box file sharing with operating system. Search button. Reset button. Gold name of operating system. Search button. Yeah. Monday, Monday, September 4th, 2017. Lazar, if I may butt in, the thing that we found so interesting about this site is that uh, Lazar adores it because it makes your life so easy. But for us, as we look at it, we find it quite problematic. I mean, it's got contrast issues. It's got big layout issues. It's got uh, typography issues so for us to pass this visually for all, those of us who use vision as the first our first way of interpreting a website it's not an easy site but the thing is it's the blind help project so it's not for us really but it's i thought it was so interesting it's like because lazar told us do you want to see the most accessible best site and and so he he took us here and we we're like well, wow, this is not accessible. So it's really interesting and so much food for thought, I feel, in looking at something I, like this. And I am actually using the verb look on purpose. Yeah. Well, you know, what's really interesting about this, and we've discussed this as we've first seen this website before. If I, if I wanted to do a blind person a big favor and say buy something for his or her or their birthday uh, I would ask like what are your favorite products and if 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 Lazar would tell me oh those products are on this website um, it would I would have to 
uh, go there and, and remember that this site has been technically designed for someone who is blind. Now imagine, and this is again with the comparison of the smell in the restaurants, if, if um, this website could have a big commercial interest in selling more products, yeah. so their products get, get spread more and more people are being helped by using these products, it would help if the website was also uh, uh, visually attractive. And this is always that topic where we harrow, if that's a correct expression about technically fully accessible or usable or, or attractive or all of it at the same time, because it's incredibly attractive to Lazar, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I have one more question for you, Lazar. Okay. If you, you were coming on to Tesco.com and we told you you can buy groceries there. Didn't you expect that you could get to uh, the, in, the, in the top menu of this website? It has all that groceries, F and F clothing. I can't see it. It's very small for me right now. But you ended up in this slider. Didn't that surprise you? Yes, uh, especially because I did not expect that. When you told me about their accessibility policy, I was very, uh, you know, pleasantly surprised, very pleasantly. And yeah, the thing is, on one hand, they did great, and on the other hand, feels like they leaned back very comfortably and thought, okay, we've made this accessible uh, one time, and uh, bye, it's okay now. I've, yeah, I also discovered story. some other things, yeah. Another question, does it ever bother you if the heading order in a site is weird? Well, to be honest, it does, but that is not the crucial thing that I uh, would use to say to assess the accessibility. Sure, uh, the headings that are correct, that are organized correctly, is just like cherry on the cake. But I personally believe that there are more um, urgent accessibility issues <clears throat> that websites and web stores need to, to take care about. What's the first thing for you? Is it that shortcut that Tesco was missing or am I? For me, yes. Now, okay. please keep in mind that I have been using a screen viewer since 2004. And uh, it might be that those things are not the first priority to someone who is brand new. I don't know how, how a person who just started right. using the screen viewer could feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe for, for me, headings are not the, the, the most important priority, but for someone who's just started, yes. So that's okay, why it's important just, to include um, this. All right, Lazar, I'm going to have to drop you up. there. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, that was just, uh, Pisha, Lazar, Anna, that was just such a, a great eye-opening experience. And from um, everyone that was uh, participating, uh, just what, uh, a really humbling experience watching the, the difficulties that we had going through that website. And um, I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be coming back for the lightning rounds. My name is Devin Egger. I'm from uh, HDC, a senior developer. And just make sure to uh, talk about your experience on the social medias, hashtag WPA. 11YDAY and hashtag WPAD2022. We'll be back shortly with the lightning talks.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining WP Accessibility Day. The sun is just coming up on the East Coast here in the US, and we've had a ton of great presentations in the last 22 hours. My name is Devin Egger, Senior Software Developer at HDC and Writer at Master WP. I'll be your host for the final two rounds today. Coming up, we have the last lightning round, three pre-recorded sessions from Empish Thomas, Pateras, Jurachenko, and Sam Alderson. Remember that because these are pre-recorded sessions, there will be no Q&A at the end, but you can always join the conversation with us in the Slido chat in the ideas section. Of course, you can also share your thoughts and comments about what's gone on in the past day of WP Accessibility Day with the hashtag uh, WPA11YDAY and hashtag WPAD2022 on all the social medias. During these lightning rounds, we will have three pre-recorded sessions from three different presenters. The very first one will be from Empish Thomas, free, freelance writer and blogger. This presentation is titled, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, How Alt Text Communicates Accessibility and Inclusion. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to my presentation, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, How All Text Communicates Accessibility and Inclusion. My name is Impish. I'm a Black woman with gray, brown, shoulder-length hair and light brown eyes. I am wearing a blue short sleeve blazer with a pink top and pearl jewelry. Many of us know a picture is worth a thousand words. And we also know the value images, graphics, and pictures bring to a blog or website. Eye-catching images enhance any website. Yet for those with vision loss, those very images can communicate exclusion if alt text is not provided. As a blind blogger and manager of a WordPress website, I know firsthand how important it is to have alt text to describe images. I am online daily and when images are not described, it hinders my overall experience and interaction with that website. In this presentation, I will share how providing alt text makes for a more accessible and inclusive experience for your visitor. I will give the definition, some best practices while sharing my personal experience with alt text. Now, definition of alt text. But before I do the definition, alt text is also known as alt tags or alt description. So those names can be used interchangeably. Alt text is a short written description of an image on a web page. These descriptions can define photos, graphics, GIFs, or videos. Basically, any information with visual content needs to have audio description. This text allows screen reading software to describe those images for those of us with vision loss. I use a screen reader daily. And when I come across an image, my screen reader will relay that image to me. If there is no alt text though, my screen reader will say graphic image with no alt text displayed. So what that tells me is that there's an image there, but I don't have any idea what to do with it, how to engage with it or anything. Although accessibility is the main focus of my talk, alt text also provides some additional features I want to alert you to. Number one, it allows search engines to rank your website. Browsers like Google can use those alt text descriptions to better understand visual content, 
affecting your page ranking and search results. Number two, it enhances the overall user experience for anyone coming to your site, regardless of disability. Now, how to add alt text to your website or blog. One of the best ways to add alt text in WordPress is through the media library. When you upload a photo or image into your media library, that image can be edited. In the editing section, there will be a box that will be labeled alt text. And in that box, you can type in your description. But what do you write in that box? This is a really good question. Here are some best practices for what to write for your alt text description. Number one, think about the purpose of your image. Why are you using it? And what do you want it to communicate? Number two, describe the actual content of that image. Number three, don't begin with phrases that begin like picture of, photo of, image of. Just go right into the content and describe your image. Number four, keep it short, sweet, and simple. I have found from my personal experience and research when writing descriptions, it can be subjective. What I mean is there is no one specific way to write all text. But what you can do is think about your audience, your loyal fans and subscribers, and any new people coming to your site and what they want. Here's some additional best practices on alt text to consider. Number one, don't stuff keywords in the alt text field. Although you are trying to enhance your SEO, enhancing, I'm sorry, although you can enhance your SEO, stuffing keywords can make the alt text complicated and difficult to understand for those of us using screen reading technology. Number two, don't use all caps. Some screen readers can interpret all caps as one word, which again makes it complicated and difficult for people with vision impairment using screen reading technology. Number three, describe race and gender. I recommend describing race and gender because it communicates diversity and inclusion. A sighted person can view this image and a blind person should have the same equal access to that information. When you don't describe race and gender, white and male is assumed to be the default. And it also can be misleading, misrepresent, and even be inaccurate. If you need images, WordPress has a stock photo catalog or library where you can pick out really great diverse and inclusive images for your website or blog. Number four, describe the text in your image. It is not guaranteed a screen reader will pick up the text within an image. So include the text as part of your alt text description. Okay, example of what I mean. You have an image of a woman holding a sign. And on that sign, there is some text. When you write your alt text description, you need to also include the text that is on that sign. Okay, number five, describe complicated images like maps, charts, and diagrams. Follow best practices for following complicated images. And here's two things to consider. First, write a short description of the image, just like a typical alt text description you would do. Number two, write a longer text with more essential details. You can even include a link where visitors can go for more information on that map 
or diagram or chart. Six, describe form buttons. Form buttons for social media and subscription, email subscriptions need to have a description so that those of us with vision impairment can know what action to take. When I've gone to a site, my screen reader will say unlabeled button. This again tells me something's there, but I don't know what to do with it, what action to take. So most of the time I don't do anything, which is not the result you want. In conclusion, this presentation, I shared the definition of alt text and its importance when it comes to accessibility, traffic, and user experience. Understanding these reasons will help you write the best alt text, resulting in an accessible and inclusive website because a picture is worth a thousand words. Thank you so much for your time and listening to my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Empus, for giving us so much valuable information there. I know as a developer, it's always a question on what would be the best alt text to give an image when we're putting them on a website. And I know that I'm gonna be sure to share this recording with uh, my clients in the future to give them a bit of extra information on what to do for their alt text. If you're just tuning in, my name is Devin Egger, Senior Software Developer at HDC and Writer at Master WP. Right now we're watching the pre-recorded sessions for our final round of lightning talks here at WordPress Accessibility Day. Coming up, we have accessibility on social media, why you should be thinking about it from Sam Alderson, social media strategist at Yoast. Sam, take it away. Welcome. If you're interested in accessibility in social media, then you're in the right place. My name is Sam, and I work for a little WordPress plugin being called Yoast. You'll find me on most of the networks as Good Plan Sam, and I'm obsessed with social and accessibility. Let's take a look at today's topics that I'm going to cover. I can't stress enough that there is so much more to this than I can cover in today's talk. I just want to get the cogs turning and get you thinking about accessibility in social media. So why is this important? Well, people use social media daily. And for me, accessibility at its absolute core is about people. Online accessibility is finally starting to get a lot more attention and that the people who use the internet are very different. They access content and services in different ways. And I hope that if you take one thing away from this, it's to remember to not make assumptions about those people that are coming to consume your content. I'm going to share with you how you can give your users, readers, customers a choice while designing for a diversity of experiences and providing different ways for people to participate and interact with your content. Opening up your content in this way means more users, more retweets, more followers, likes, link clicks. Just to give you an idea about how people interact with social media, here are some fun numbers because we all love stats. Facebook reported in 2016, 85% of people watch videos without sound. They also found that 80% of people who watch videos with captions are more likely to watch the entire video. Similarly, YouTube found that, cap that videos with captions had 10% more view time. The point is not that captions are important, though don't get me wrong, they definitely are. It's that different people consume content in different ways and have different needs. When you tweet, share or interact on social media, you cannot be sure that the person on the other side will fully understand what you've sent. And if that person can't see, read or engage with that content, then you need to be doing something about it. So you may be thinking, yes, Sam, I know this already. Where do I start? Well, let's start with images. A lot of what we do on the social team at Yoast is visual and designed to convey specific information. For example, we use images to tell a story, to, to convey a message or to get people to take an action. There are numerous different people consuming our content in different ways who have different challenges. I have to say though, we have an outstanding design team at Yoast that keeps everyone in check when it comes to accessibility, so huge props to them. So what are some of the basics to take into consideration when it comes to images? There are specific challenges that come around with colour and contrast. For example, you shouldn't rely on colour alone to convey a message. 
If some of your audience was colorblind, then the key information in this chart may be lost or change meaning. This Instagram post relies on me being able to see red versus green and to understand that green is good and that red is bad, but that green is also half of this chart. This also relies on a cultural context of red being bad and green being good, which is not universal. So to make this post more accessible, we need to label the key information that we want to get across. That's better. See how we've added the percentages? They may be small, but it's something to keep in mind. But this is more about catering to those who are colorblind. The colors that we use and their relationships to each other is also something that you need to take into account. We can't assume that people see images the same way that a person with 20-20 vision sees them. But thinking about contrast can help. I've taken most of the colour out of this image to show you how some people may experience it. You can still identify the key parts, the message still makes sense, but it's not perfect. The contrast is not great near the bottom of the image. However, the key information is still readable and the text is still readable. This brings me on to text in images. It's something, again, that we do a lot at Yoast. Almost all of our posts have complex images with text on it. There are guidelines and tools that you can use to ensure that the contrast ratios of your text is sufficient against the background colour. Do note, though, that there are minimum contrast ratios based on the different sizes of the fonts that you use, so be aware. Other things to be mindful of is that the text in the image is inaccessible to screen readers. So it's best practice to include that text that's in the image in the caption of your post. Next, let's consider alt text. This is the text that is read aloud by assistive technologies. Images fall into three different categories when it comes to alt text, though on social media, for us at least, it's almost always informative. So first we have the informative images. These are the ones that convey meaning. Next, you have functional images. Those have a specific role or purpose, for example, a logo. Then you have decorative ones, and these are just for show. W3C has a really handy decision tree that you can use to help you figure out which categories your images fall into. But for social media, it's almost always informative. So when it comes to alt text, what, we, what do you need to do? Well, there are a few best practices to keep in mind when writing them. Keeping it short is best, writing proper sent sentences and generally around 125 to 140 characters is the best way to go. It's effectively a short tweet. There are some platforms that provide you with a lot of room to write your alt text. Twitter, for example, lets you write a thousand characters if you really want to. And with the surge of AI images, this amount of space can be super helpful. All social platforms have this function to add the alt text to your images, and I'll show you where you can find those. I'm going to share with you an example of an Instagram post from a while ago from our account. So here we go. Yoast SEO is now available on Shopify basically the text in the image. While it's fine, it doesn't actually describe the image itself. There is important context here that we haven't communicated, so let's add some more. Here you can see we now have the text in the image and a brief description of the image itself. But we could go further. That's much better. Do you see how adding extra layers and context builds the picture? You could prove this even further, but this is much of an art as it is a science, so filling in something basic is better than not doing it at all. It gets you into the habit, at least, of filling in these fields. Remember that you have the context of your images and photos. Describe them as if you're talking to someone who has never seen them before. Utilize that. Here are some best practices to keep in mind when it comes to alt texts. So take screenshots. OK, so now we know what you should be writing, but where do you add this? This can obviously be done directly in the platforms itself, and some scheduling services are now catching up and actually adding this functionality as well. I'm going to show you quickly how to add an alt text to your images. On Twitter, you compose your tweet like normal. You see that in the bottom right hand corner, you have the alt text button. You can write your description in there and then you can save it. This will then show that the image has an alt attribute. This has to be done before you tweet, so do remember that. You cannot edit this after the fact. One great thing that Twitter has introduced is that you can turn on a notification that will remind you to add an alt attribute before you actually tweet your tweet. So if you're tweeting out a photo, it will remind you to add that alt text. It's a big win. On Instagram, it's a bit hidden. It's in the advanced settings. So once you go there, you need to then fill it in and save it, but you can edit this after posting. On Facebook, there is an AI that can do this for you, but it can get it wrong. So it's better, better practice to actually write it yourself. 
AI alt attributes are rarely good. They may do a reasonable job of identifying what's in the picture, but they lack your context. Let's talk videos, especially short form video. They're only getting bigger. I could do a whole talk about that, but that's not for today. We're seeing that TikTok is heavily influencing our content consumption and the other networks are working hard to catch up. Facebook recently added a version of it, its version of TikTok to the home feed. So video is here to stay from a social perspective. It's good to remember that YouTube is also a social network with a huge and diverse audience that have very high standards and very little patience. So the small details matter. There's a lot to consider when it comes to videos, but one of the easier things that you can do to, is to add captions or subtitles to your videos. But what's the difference? Captions convey all the essential audio, dialogue, music, sound effects. They're intended for audiences who cannot hear the audio. Subtitles, however, convey the dialogue only. They're intended for audience that can hear but not understand the audio. On social media, these terms are used interchangeably, but outside of that, they're used for more specific reasons. There are also two types of captions that you can use. We have the closed captions, meaning that a user can turn them on and off, which gives them the choice. Or you have open captions, which are actually burnt into the video themselves. And sometimes this can cause problems with subtitles actually overlaying them. Every single platform has the ability for you to add closed captions to your videos. Though sometimes they're not formatted the best. So let's do a bit of a quick rundown. It's also worth noting that subtitles makes translation and localization a lot easier. YouTube can do this automatically. However, you must review these. This is not 100% accurate. You need to pay attention to the wording and the timings, especially if the person talking has a thick accent. You could also upload an SRT file or paste in the script if there is one. This will give you a much more accurate result. Programs like Descript are a great help. Twitter can do it automatically, but it's hit and miss, so stick with uploading the captions to the Twitter media library. Instagram and TikTok also have options to do closed captions. They're pretty accurate, but you do need to edit them um, to make sure that everything makes sense. Instagram stories, however, is not styled great and they're not exposed to screen readers, so the text isn't available for everyone. With Facebook, again, you could trust the AI, but this can still be hit or miss. So review these once the video has been processed or upload an SRT file or the script to ensure that you have them correct and concise. Okay, we're on the home straight. And these three can be the most annoying when it comes to social media accessibility. First, we have emojis. Emojis have a text description, like an alt attribute, meaning that this is actually read aloud by assistive programs. So this meme from a couple of years ago is a great example of how not to use emojis. I perceive this visually to be red flags. However, a user with a screen reader, this says, I am not on Twitter, triangular flag, triangular flag, triangular flag, triangular flag, you, you get my point. So if you're going to use emojis, make sure that you use them towards the end of your copy, or if it's between sentences, make sure that they have context. When it comes to hashtags, please use camel case. Basically capitalizing each word in the tag. It helps the word to breathe when read aloud by assistive technologies. It also means that screen readers will read it out as singular words as opposed to one contained word. Here's an example of a hashtag that has gone down in social media history and is still brought up as an example of what not to do. Also note that acronyms and initialisms like SEO, for example, should always be capitalized. Custom fonts. Oh, custom fonts. Custom fonts were very trendy back in the 90s and seem to have come back into trend every now and then. I don't know about you, but this really makes me shake my head when I see people do this because it tells me that the person doing this really does not understand accessibility at all. Screen readers cannot process this as text. They'll often mistake this for math or worse, they'll just ignore it, which means that you're neglecting a huge chunk of your audience. This also goes for ASCII art. While this is cute for me, this is very exclusionary. Please think about this before you do it. Think about the person who is consuming your content. I know that was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but this is something that we should all be thinking about in order to be inclusive. This is only the tip of the iceberg as well. Like I said at the beginning, there is a lot to this. 
But once you know, you know, and you start spotting other people doing these mistakes. Here are just a few of the key takeaways from this talk, and I hope that you're enjoying the rest of the WordPress accessibility today. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Sam. Just so much helpful information you just provided us with there. I mean, just learning how to provide alt text and captions and social media posts and thinking about our presentation of our posts can be just such a game changer for us. If you're just tuning in, my name is Devin Egger, Senior Software Developer at HTC and Writer at Master WP, and we're watching the pre-recorded sessions for our final round of Lightning Talks. If you had any specific questions for Sam after that presentation, she's with us in the Slido chat. You can talk with her directly there and feel free to join the conversation uh, as we're going through these last uh, these last sessions. Um, just as a reminder, these pre-recorded sessions, there is no Q&A, but again, you can join us with the, in the conversation in the Slido chat, uh, the Slido ideas section in, uh, in, the, in the chat there. Coming up, we have Pieteris Jurachenko, uh, CEO, UX designer, and accessibility expert at SIA Turn Digital. He's giving us a presentation on the future of accessibility, or sorry, the future of accessibility statement. And um, that will be the last lightning round talk we have uh, for the WordPress Accessibility Day. All right, Peter, let's bring it home for us. Hello, my name is Petris, and four years ago, with colleagues, we create initiative pieklustamiba.lv, which means accessibility.lv in Latvian. We do research and training on accessibility, but we have also create practical tools. For example, schooliovp.com is a platform based on WordPress for school to create accessible websites in few days. We have also created accessibility statement generation plugin, and I will tell you in more details about this plugin. But for beginning, what is accessibility statement? I will describe it as a page on the website that tell you what is accessible and what is not accessible on this website and who to contact in case of problems. Usually, the link on this page is in the footer somewhere next to the privacy policy. Here you can see examples and links on the European Parliament, Go UK, and the US President's page. Why provide an accessibility statement? In some situation, you may be required to provide an accessibility statement, such as public institution in countries that implement the EU Web Accessibility Directive. But the main reason are to show users that you are care about accessibility and about them. Provide information which content on your page is accessible and which is not and how to deal with it. Publish information about website accessibility evaluation and contact information if user need help with content accessibility. Demonstrate commitment to accessibility and to social responsibility. What to include in accessibility statement? It depends on the country and regulation. Some countries have templates. Some ask to include a results of website evaluation. Web Accessibility Initiative recommends include commitment to accessibility, which accessibility standards such as WCAG 2.1 and which level A, 2A or 3A is applied. Contact information and response time in case user encounter problems. It also good practice to provide information about any known limitation in your website to avoid frustration of your users. For example, old videos do not have subtitles. Measures taken by your organization to ensure accessibility. For example, websites evaluation and use it methodology. Technical prerequisites such as supported web browsers. 
environment in which the content has been tested to work and also references to applied national or local laws and policies. Is accessibility statement required? It depends in which country your website operate and which sector your organization operate. For example, in Latvian, our government implements the European Accessibility Directive, which is mandatory to public institution and publicly owned companies, but it is not mandatory to private companies yet. On the website of Web Accessibility Initiative, you can see the regulation in every country, but this information is mostly from 2080 and they plan to start publishing the updates in this November. Here you can see example of Nordic insurance company. This is a private company that operates in seven countries with different regulation. You can see that the link related to accessibility is only on three of websites. It is interesting that Apple defines accessibility as an Apple value, but this value is not translated in every language. For example, in Latvian, websites only privacy was mentioned as value. So, if you are planning to include accessibility statement on your website, is there a tool or generator which can help you get generate an accessibility statement? First to mention is Web Accessibility Initiative Accessibility Statement Generator. You can fill in simple form and generate a plain HTML file. All fields are with info and examples. Another publicly available tool is Accessibility and Usability Statement Generator from Portugal's uh, go government ecosystem. It requires more detailed information, including uh, a usability test with people with disabilities. As a result, you get a HTML file, which you can copy paste to your website. There is similar tool of Belgium government. And a very nice tool is from Nomensa. All tools provide a form to be filled in and generate HTML file. There are some issues with this approach. Information is either too general for the needs of different countries or too specific if the tool is designed for a specific country. It would be nice to adapt this tool for different countries but is not possible as they are not plugins. Some of generation provide source code but you need to run and host this tool somewhere. They do not have centralized repository like WordPress plugin and translation. All generators provide result as HTML block or file, which means it is hard to update next year and problems to copy paste in machine readable format. And yes, this is not the WordPress way. We tried to solve previously mentioned issues in the WordPress way. And one of them is the WordPress plugin and I will demonstrate it later. Another approach is create and publish accessibility statement for each country as a pattern, which pattern way it will not solve all problem with machine readable format. For example, if you have plan uh, update some tags or ID values, you can do it only for new content, not for previously published it. With plugin update, you can improve machine readable uh, afterwards. What to expect uh, from WordPress plugin? Provide information and links to local regulation website. Provide text example, description, edit, not create. Fill in some custom fields. Result work in any theme, provide only semantic content, not style. Result in machine readable format, content can be easy updated like normal page. Ability to customize template content from WordPress admin, not only from code. Let's see how it works. When you activate accessibility statement plugin, it will create a page 
accessibility statement because this plugin is in Latvian, this page called Pekljust Memes Paziņojums. When you edit this page, it use uh, ACF. If you have it, use your own. If you not have it, use included uh, parts of uh, ACF, which was available uh, open source previously. Uh, here you can um, fill it with forms. You have link to local guidelines uh, where you you can uh, get information how to check and what to include in this accessibility statement. And it works like normal uh, WordPress page. You can update, uh, you can preview changes. And for example, here it creates semantic HTML inside in WordPress. And if you change theme, it works with any theme. And if you change theme, it will work with another team as well, because it's only HTML without style. What uh, we get in this HTML, we get uh, this machine readable tags as well. And if you want to change this template, change this machine readable tag, you can do it by uh, from WordPress administration as well. Go to the settings, accessibility statement setting, and here is uh, text and, um, and uh, classes or specific tags for um, creation. What I think about future of WordPress um, accessibility statement actually is two ways. Um, be like plugin, one or many plugins and um, new pattern library. I think pattern library is an uh, easy way, but you cannot update some, some things after you publish this statement. In, in plugin way, it's uh, possible to update this machine readable tags on information with plugin updates afterwards. And um, yeah, if, if some, some content change plugins is um, more, more better way to uh, use in, in WordPress. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Pateras, for shedding some light on accessibility statements for us. I know that as a developer, what to include on those pages can always just be a, a bit of a mystery. So thank you for that. That concludes the final round of lightning talks on WP WordPress Accessibility Day 2022. My name is Devin Egger, senior software developer at HDC and writer at MasterWP, and I'm your host for the final few sessions today. We do have one more presentation coming up, Damon Cook with dialogues, modals, and pop-ups. But as we're getting close to bringing this WordPress Accessibility Day 2022 to a close, I just wanted to take a quick second to thank all of our presenters, volunteers, and organizers putting on a 24-hour live event across the entire planet with people in so many different countries and time zones is just such a huge undertaking. I really just want to take a second and commend everyone involved for making it through and creating such an awesome experience for us. Uh, please remember that you can share your thoughts and comments on social media with the hashtag WPA11YDAY and hashtag WPAD2022. And uh, remember, you know, any and all feedback is great. You can provide feedback on social medias and you can also uh, join the conversation in the ideas and Q&A section on the Slido presentation as well. Um, we'll be right back with one more final presentation from uh, Damon Cook. And right now we're just gonna take a quick break. Thanks everyone for joining.
Hello, let's just do a quick sound check. I am getting echoes. Hello. Hello. Let's just do a quick sound check. I'm getting echoes. Do you have the YouTube video open? Make sure you close that. Hello. There we go. Yes, much better. Much better. All right. So we're good with sound. Um, if you want to just use the present button to share your screen, that will get it queued up for me. And I'm going to remove both of us from the feed. And then we'll, um, at the hour, bring Devin in to introduce you and then add you and your screen back in. Okay, let me see. Chrome. How does that look? That's pretty good. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, so we'll go out and you'll come back in after you get introduced. Okay. Thanks.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for WordPress Accessibility Day 2022. My name is Devin Egger, Senior Software Developer at HTC and Writer at Master WP, and I'm your host for the final session today. Well, gang, the sun is up, the birds are chirping, and we've made it full uh, through a full 23 hours of learning and sharing about accessibility and WordPress. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Truly a stand-up job from all the presenters, volunteers, and organizers for this year's event. A huge thank you to everyone involved for making this happen. Just as a quick note, we did have a question pop up in the Q&A from the last presentation asking, when will the recordings be published and available on YouTube? The answer to this question and other similar questions you might have can be found on the FAQ page of the WordPress Accessibility Day website at wpaccessibility.day slash FAQ. Following this session, we'll have a live Q&A session with Damon, our presenter. So please remember to join us in Slido. That's the chat section just to the side or below the video you're watching now. You can post your questions in the Q&A section or just join the conversation in the ideas section. All right, we're down to our final presentation, folks. One I know a bunch of us have been waiting for. Coming up is Damon Cook with dialogues, modals, and pop-ups. Damon is a developer advocate at my favorite hosting provider, WP Engine. Previously, he navigated the WordPress agency land for around a decade. He's a purveyor and discover, discoverer of musical frisson. He can be found in the realms of WordPress Slack, WooCommerce Slack, and Twitter. All right, without further ado, here's Damon. Take it away, Damon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today at WordPress Accessibility 2022. Um, I'm Damon Cook, a developer advocate at WP Engine. Uh, formerly, I spent over a decade as a front-end developer in a variety of WordPress-centric agencies. Uh, today, <clears throat> I'm here to talk about modals, pop-ups, dialogues, light boxes, and alerts. These are all pretty common terms often used to describe similar website interfaces we often interact with on a daily basis. Some love them, some hate them, and they're often an evil, evil necessity. First, I want to differentiate some of the common native dialogues we often see from the non-native dialogues. Next, we'll dive into the differences between modals, light boxes, and pop-ups. With an understanding of the differences between these interface terms, we can then dive into some best practices for implementing dialogues and create a clear pathway for users to access our site's content. The later half of my presentation will take a deep dive into code where we step through building up an ideal dialogue experiment experience. But first, I want to start with a little personal story. I don't know about you, but I'm getting old. A past, in the past few years, I've been experiencing some mild chronic back pain. It is from years of sitting and general inactivity. I started stretching uh, and walking to try and combat the persistent aches. I use my walks to enjoy time in nature and appreciate all the simple things I can. My breath, my movement, and my senses are all at the forefront of these experiences. Most of the time, I stick to the same path. It is a city-owned nature trail which snakes between the Hudson River on one side and a canal on the other side. Throughout my years of walking this path, I've encountered obstacles. Sometimes after a storm, there'll be a large tree trunk across the path. Other times, I've been chased by monstrous Canadian geese protecting their family. In a lot of ways, these obstacles are similar to pop-ups. They can inhibit the flow of walking or deter the whole activity altogether, which was the case for me when the geese were nesting. Why do I share this? Well, we're all constantly being made aware of our mortality through various small and sometimes dramatic experiences. Perhaps our vision or hearing is degrading, or in my case, my mobility has been a challenge. Old age is a common thread we can all somehow relate to, and ultimately, we're all just temporarily abled. So why not build a web for our future selves? Well, we're currently, 
whether you're currently visually impaired, have severe motor issues, mobility challenges, or we're on a migratory path to any one of these experiences, it is imperative to build for everyone to access and use our content on the web. So let's dig in on how to create better pathways with dialogues. First, I want to clarify these different user interface patterns and compare their similarities and differences. Often these words, dialog, alert, light box, pop up, prompt, and modal can become intertwined. Let's start with what I classify as built in or native dialogues. These native dialogues allow for communication between the user and the system and are typically styled by the browser or operating system that is displaying them. I'm sure we've all experienced these types of dialogues on our devices. These interfaces are often where developers begin their journey because JavaScript allows for quick access to things like window.alert, window.prompt, window.confirm, and even window.print JavaScript methods. Again, these are fine and dandy for allowing the users to interface directly with the browser. Common use cases for native dialogues are system access permissions, like allow this site to access your microphone, or destructive actions, like are you sure you want to quit Safari? You have 782 tabs open, which is often the case for me. These dialogues can be broken down further by action types, like one, two, and three action dialogues, which refer to the amount of button options available for each prompt. The remaining user interface patterns besides native dialogues are modals, pop-ups, and light boxes. For the most part, these are non-native implementations, whereas developers have the option to control and manipulate their appearance. Hence, it is far more common to encounter these on a web page. These can be differentiated by the idea that they are all that they all pop up and typically have an overlay or semi-opaque background behind them. The overlay background may indicate that the items behind cannot be accessed while the dialogue is open. We'll dive into the nuances of this particular concept in a bit when it comes to best practices. The first non-native user interface is pop-ups. Pop-ups represent components that pop up on the user's screen and typically display marketing material. Usually these pop-ups appear on page load and can be synonymous with landing pages. One example is either the ubiquitous join our mailing list form that encourages users to sign up and receive emails. Light boxes are the next example of a non-native interface that is usually associated with images and pop up to enlarge a respective thumbnail image on the page. Last, we have modals, which are typically triggered with the user's initiation. An example of this is a login modal which would pop up a form with a background overlay and allow a user to sign in to their account. You may ask, when should I use a dialog? And this is a great question, something to always ask ourselves when tempting the idea. It can seem easy to tuck content away in a dialog if screen estate becomes an issue, especially on smaller mobile devices. However, it introduces context switching, which has its own set of complicating factors. And at the end of the day, if something is going to be hidden away in an off-screen dialog, then it should be considered whether it is necessary and whether the hidden content could instead be prioritized into the existing document flow. Best practices. Now, 
Let's dive in on what makes an ideal dialogue experience for any and all users to access our content. But first, did you know that there is already a dialogue HTML element? Wild, right? Unfortunately, the implementation between browsers can be wildly inconsistent, and still it largely requires JavaScript to work. For example, currently in Chrome, clicking the backdrop of this native element does not dismiss the dialogue. Also, the styling for the dialogue element is left to each browser's discretion, which is never ideal. Fortunately, we have Kitty Girardel's A11Y Dialog Lightweight JavaScript Package, which is the recommended tool for creating dialogues on the web today. Kitty's package has been extensively tested and documented, and they're constantly revisiting additional testing and updates to the package. This package follows the dialog modal pat pattern from the ARIA authoring practices guide and is unopinionated with CSS styling and it is lightweight. Again, here's an overview of best practices and we'll dive into these one by one. Um, being mindful uh, to maintain focus, semantic markup buttons versus links and allow for keyboard interaction. One thing I like to note when building these complex custom interfaces is that before you reach for ARIA roles, always consider whether you're using the right HTML markup. ARIA can update the accessibility tree, but does nothing for displaying or altering functionality on a page. Ultimately, HTML with a sprinkle of CSS, then some JavaScript. This is the ideal order of operation when it comes to creating a progressively enhanced experience. Here I have an image from a website. Um, it's a music review site, uh, which contains um, a dialogue. As the user visits the site, um, the dialogue after about, I think, 30 seconds is shows up on the screen. Um, and prompts the user for a newsletter uh, form to subscribe. Um, this to go over some of the, the takeaways here, when the dialog has been opened, it is important to take track focus on two things. Programmatically log the item that was last focused right before the dialog was opened. You can use the document.activeElement JavaScript for this which is typically the element that triggered the action. And immediately shift focus to the most meaningful element within the dialog. We want to log the focus because we want to restore focus back to that element that had it before the dialog was open. Basically, we want to maintain the user's journey and not place them somewhere arbitrary, like the beginning or end of the document. However, once the dialog is opened, then we want to create a trap for tabbing and focus. If the user tabs forward, then they should be able to cycle through all tabbable items and can circuitously loop through them. One of the, those items should be the close button. Which element to focus when the dialog is opened depends on the type and amount of content within the dialog. Some ideas might be focusing the first element in the dialog or focusing the close button, which gives the user a quick means to bail on the experience or less common set focus on the dialog itself. Here I've uh, taken a short video demonstrating um, another uh, music review site. And in this video, um, I am tabbing through, well, actually there is a dialogue which is uh, presented on top of the existing page. And I'm tabbing through to show that um, the rest of the document is actually not inert below the dialogue, which is not ideal. Um, this allows us to continue tabbing through the page in the background 
um, and basically detracts from the whole the whole dialogue experience. Once a dialogue is open, it is not only important to trap and maintain focus, but also be sure to make the rest of the document behind it dormant. This can be achieved by assigning ARIA modal true to the wrapping dialogue element. This signals to screen readers that the content beneath the dialogue are not part of the dialogue's content. It is important to remember that ARIA only updates the accessibility tree and setting ARIA modal equals true does nothing to modify the element's visual appearance or functionality. In other words, JavaScript and CSS is required. Um, again, this is the same uh, music review site and with the same dialogue presented uh, in a video that I've captured and I'm demonstrating how with the dialogue open, the page behind it is still scrollable, which is typically not ideal. So also keep in mind that when a dialogue is open, the window will still process scroll events. This can be usually be mixed or usually be fixed by adding a class to the HTML element when the dialogue is open and setting some CSS for overflow Y hidden. But this is not always bulletproof and things can quickly get complicated when you're targeting different devices or if you're dealing with multiple CSS position elements on the page. Kitty offers some basic uh, scroll locking techniques within the A11Y dialog package. And also there is a body scroll lock package for a foolproof and lightweight uh, JavaScript solution. Now let's dig in on marking up a dialog. Semantic markup is a great thing. We can start scaffolding the markup for a dialog by locating the actual dialog content outside of the main element content of the page. Most importantly, the dialogue and main content are still co-located in the document, but the dialogue logistically represents a whole other document when opened, which is important to remember as this can confuse assistive technologies if not accounted for. Next, we can add the hidden attribute to our wrapping dialog div container. This will hide the div from the page and screen readers, and we do not have to worry about any flashing content on the page load until we're ready to display the dialog. A quick aside, buttons versus links, the age old battle. Buttons are best for clickable actions like sign up, download, or open. Also, if you want a user to trigger something with JavaScript, then usually you want a button. Links are best used to take users to another page or as an anchor to a different target on the same page. Oftentimes, developers will use a link because they do not know how to style a button to remove its button-like appearance. More often, you'll want a button to trigger a dialog open and a separate button within the dialog markup to close. Another common pitfall for developers is properly including an SVG icon in your button markup. Remember, if the icon is purely decorative, then hide it from screen readers with ARIA hidden true. Set focusable false for IE and avoid any additional tab stops. And set a screen reader, a class of screen reader text on a wrapping span around the text, which will position and pull the text off the screen, but when tabbed to, it'll still be visible to screen readers. Also use CSS to set pointer events none on the SVG if you want to refrain the element from your click events which is typically the case. Now back to our markup. Now that we're equipped with a better understanding of buttons, let's get back to the markup in our dialogue and add buttons to our overall 
markup. We'll add one for the opening trigger and one for the closing of the dialog. Next thing, we'll want to incorporate our overlay or sometimes called the backdrop. This will be the semi-opaque background behind the dialog that helps visually establish the barrier between the main document and our dialog document. Also note in the code that we're also introducing an additional wrapping div element around our actual dialog content and assigning it the role of document. Assigning role document helps signal assistive technology that this is a browsable content that can be accessed in reading mode. This ARIA role is used in complex content context switching widgets like a dialog. Ultimately, we'll want to make sure that clicking events on the backdrop will close the dialog, but we'll also want to be sure to distinguish the boundaries between the actual dialog and the backdrop. The dialog area itself should not trigger the closing and just the backdrop and the close button. Next, we'll want to add a unique ID to our dialog's main wrapping div div element. This will help with instantiating it with JavaScript and allow for the possibility of having multiple dialogues on a page, each having a unique ID, of course. Also, we'll add aria hidden true for the initial state of our dialogue and to hide it from assistive technology. Last, we'll add an h1 element for our dialogue's title. This is significant for screen readers to be able to associate a title with this dialog, which correlates with the ID that we assign to the dialog's wrapping div in the aria labeled by attribute. To finalize the hookup for using the A11Y dialog package, we'll need to add the package's data attributes to target the show and hide action triggers. While we mostly covered uh, the best practices with tabbing and focus order, one thing that is important to consider is if the dialogue's content has a lot of stuff, then you'll likely want to elevate the priority of the close button. Make it easy for users to opt out of the dialogue early. Also be sure to use a button element because this affords keyboard navigation of using the enter and spacebar key to trigger the close and opening of the dialogue. Again, uh, there's a uh, screenshot here of the uh, music review site um, dialogue that is open and it's showing the tab order that exists in this example. Um, the first field is, uh, or the first focused element is the, the email address field. Uh, the second and third are, um, the second one is get new music Friday. And the third is no thanks, which would uh, also uh, dismiss the dialogue. And then there are a few links at the bottom to uh, user agreement and privacy policy statements, which are also uh, focusable. And then the last item, the seventh um, focus element is the close button. And this is a pretty ideal uh, experience of the, for the tabbing order. Uh, uh, there was, this wouldn't be a, a presentation without touching on some WordPress um, existing uh, components. Some examples of dialogues and other accessibility helpers within WordPress. Um, if you were to build a custom block. Um, the block, the Gutenberg's uh, WordPress components package contains a visually hidden component and a modal component. Um, so it's always best to, to try to leverage cores um, existing packages uh, to line up with that. Um, and then I also provided a link here for uh, screen reader text class, which I believe WordPress also outputs on in several instances, but you still have to incorporate the CSS into your theme or plugin to uh, tie it together. 
Um, also in the since I think WordPress 5.8, the navigation block um, utilizes a dialog and they're actually using a package called Micromodal, which is a JavaScript dependency to surface the uh, toggle menu functionality. And I have a, a video here demonstrating um, in the Frost theme how uh, to trigger open and close this uh, mobile uh, menu, which uses the Micromodal, as I said. And there's a link at the bottom to uh, an overview of the navigation block. I hope this presentation has helped you consider the right time when to use a dialogue and whether it is a most effective means of organizing your site's content. Please be sure to reach out on Twitter. I am at D Cook, C O O K. And um, share any examples of dialogues, whether they're good, bad. Um, reach out and uh, thanks for having me today. And uh, if there's any questions in the chat, I'd be happy to follow up. Awesome. Thanks, Damon. And uh, wow, just uh, truly great information. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Uh, some really good stuff that we can benefit from. I know uh, personally, I have to handle how to effectively build experiences like this pretty much every day. And um, if any of you are like me and watching everything that you shared, I'm asking myself, oh, no, did I did I leave some users out on the last website that I built? And, um, well, you know, that's just that's kind of the point of uh, these presentations, this whole event, that this is a uh, accessibility is a journey and we're all learning here no matter what level we're on. Um, but seriously, thank you. Uh, we do have some questions. The first one from Joe Dolson. Uh, are there any existing WordPress plugins that you know of that create a good uh, functional dialogue? Um, unfortunately, I did not. I have not recently researched the existing plugins that that provide that. So no, I do not have an answer to that. But I would be happy to follow up probably on Twitter because I would be curious myself to uh, test out a few plugins and see uh, which ones do a good job of it. Likewise, likewise. And I'm wondering also if there's any good uh, blocks as well. Uh, let's see, there is another question from Curtis. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, so are these specific um, WCAG guidelines are, uh, related to the behavior and mo of modals and dialogues? Or is everything that you talked about here just best practices? Um, they are best practices, but they also do re relate to several key, uh, guidelines for sure around this type of, uh, widget dialogue widget. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, let's see a couple more. And, uh, Amber did chime in and said that, uh, pop-up maker does a good job of doing good, good dialogues. Oh, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. So we got another question in the chat from Darren. He said, in the accessible forms talk yesterday, they mentioned that you shouldn't put anything after the submit button on a form because the submit button is considered the end of the form. Do you have any comments on that regarding the dialogue that you showed? Is you know our dialogues kind of like a special case with that? Uh, what's your thoughts there? No, I think that um, I think that hold would hold likely hold true as a best practice as well when the form exists in a dialogue um i would think yes definitely the the submit button would be a, a great stop a tab stop there um besides i guess being able to cycle to the close um that's a good question yeah i don't i think it's right. probably going to be a, a based on context and preference in a way there could be, if, especially if the form is really long, you might want to get to the close button quick and give the option. Um, but yeah, that submit button would probably be key as well. So I agree. I agree. Oh, there's more questions popping up. This is great. Um, so, question from Anonymous If a site has an alert pop up that is used during an emergency, it covers the front page and has a close buttons, a close button. Any suggestions for accessibility? 
Um, there is mm -hmm. a, uh, I believe it's a special um, ARIA role alert dialogue, um, which the, uh, the A11Y uh, dialogue package also accounts for. Um, but I think there definitely are some further considerations in that, that instance, because you'll want to surface, um, additional information as to, and if there's any timing on the action, uh, you know, whether it's something that is going to, if it's a dialogue that's going to appear and then go away after a certain amount of time, um, right. surfacing that information to screen readers is, is key. Um, so that everybody knows what's going on, if that dialogue is going to come and go and how, how long the action is, is you have to take on the action. Right. And if, you know, if there's like urgency or involved yeah. or if it, if that dialogue is also going to probably, maybe if that di dialogue is going to affect your experience coming back to the website, I'm thinking right. that's a really good question. Uh, we do have another question and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to scope this down just a little bit. Uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes developers make in regards to modals, uh, dialogues, pop-ups? I have a couple I can think of in mind, but what's, what's your thoughts on that, Damon? Um, I think the two I tried to highlight was whether to use a button or a link to trigger them. Um, I think yep. the button usually affords uh, so much more, uh, and, it's usually just a case of um, a developer doesn't feel like unstyling a button, which is unfortunate, but yeah, usually a button is the best case in those scenarios. But then also the only, the other thought I have is setting um, focus in the modal. Um, lots of times that's a, that's a common, they just kind of skip that idea uh, and open up the modal or, and just leave it to whatever experience happens. Um, but that's a key thing is is setting focus there. I totally agree. And one thing I can think of also um, when, especially when like the modal is a search, you know, and so if you click on the search uh, magnifying glass and it pops open a modal for the search, um, you know, make sure that 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 focus goes to the search, right? right. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, there's a good question from Amber here. Are there any special considerations for modals or pop-ups on mobile or if a specific low vision user is zoomed in to the 200 uh, plus uh, percent on their computer? What uh, specific considerations do you think we can make for that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of it would probably be applicable applicable to CSS styling and accounting for different screen sizes and trying to make things as responsive as possible. Um, you know, using uh, probably some fluid typography. Um, but yeah, th and with that being said, as well, the the whole scroll locking that that comes into play. Um, whether on different devices, you know, there isn't necessarily a scroll element, but a touch element to uh, still have that background page be scrollable is typically you don't want to lose that context of where you are on the page in the background versus where you are on the page in the, in the foreground or the dialogue in the foreground. So keeping that across all devices, keeping that context is, is key. Right, right. So you, so you mean like if I'm on my phone or like an iPad and I've scrolled halfway down the page, it pops up a modal yep. and I close that, making sure that it doesn't take me back to the top of the page exactly, or, or something, make sure it comes right back to where I was on yep. the page. Definitely. It's a really, really great point there. Uh, let's see. I'll give it just a couple more seconds to see if we have any more questions pop up. And if not, we're going to have Amber come back in with some closing remarks. Uh, um, just to reintroduce, this is Damon Cook, developer advocate from uh, WP Engine. Again, personally, my favorite hosting provider. Um, my name is Devin Egger, a senior software developer uh, at HDC and writer at Master WP. You're watching the final closing presentation of WP Accessibility Day 2022. And uh, it actually does not look like we have any more questions coming up. So I'm assuming that Amber will be joining us shortly. There she is. 
Hello. This Amber. was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, Damon, for uh, closing yeah. us out. I've been watching our viewer count tick up and up and up and up. Yeah. <laughs> so very popular topic, very important. Also, sometimes tricky to get right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, well, I think we probably will. I'll wave goodbye to you all and just have myself in. And then um, we can do a little wrap up here. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Devin. Well, thank you, everyone. We have reached the end of our time together for WordPress Accessibility Day. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, sponsors, volunteers, and attendees for 24 fabulous hours of accessibility presentations and discussions in the chat. This year, we were excited to have over 1,600, I think it was 1,604 last time I looked, registrants from 52 different countries. And to be able to donate $2,000 to Nobility, a nonprofit that is focused on website accessibility. Without our sponsors, this event wouldn't be possible. The contributions from our sponsors allow us to hire professional captioners and American Sign Language interpreters to pay for our speakers and to cover all of the varied costs in running an online event like this. Thank you especially to Platinum sponsors, Cloudways, Gravity Forms, and WP Engine. Gold sponsors, 20i, Equalize Digital, and Yoast, and all of our silver and bronze sponsors, micro sponsors, and donors as well. A huge thank you, big, big thank you to all of the volunteers who have been hosting sessions, moderating the chat, and keeping the stream running in the background. I have a few other final notes before we sign off for the day. First of all, as we've been telling you at every session, your feedback is important. It will be used to improve WordPress Accessibility Day for next year. You can anonymously submit feedback about the whole event or any individual session on our feedback page on our website. Feedback will be accepted through Wednesday, November 9th, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. U.S. Central Time. If you want to win a WordPress Accessibility Day t-shirt, you can choose to be entered to win when you submit feedback. The more things you provide feedback on, the more entries you get to win a t-shirt. So please go and submit feedback. We very much appreciate anything that you can tell us so that we can make the event even better and more amazing next year. Uh, on that note, other things that are still open, sponsor swag and giveaways are still open. Please make sure you visit our sponsor pages and take advantage of their generous offers. The giveaways that are open will accept entries until midnight U.S. Central Time today. So please make sure to go submit yourself if you want to win some of our great sponsor giveaways today. Sooner is better. Want to keep learning. So if you've been inspired by what you saw today and you want to keep learning, there are a couple of different options. One that we like to encourage is please attend the WordPress Accessibility Meetup. These are free meetups, part of the official WordPress Meetup program. They happen twice a month on Zoom and are live captioned. Meetups are held on the first Thursday of the month in the morning in the US for me, and on the third Monday in the evening in the US. So there should be something that works no matter your time zone at least once a month. Uh, you can view upcoming meetups on meetup.com or if you go to the WordPress Meetup Programs website, you can find them there as well. Do you want to be more involved in supporting accessibility in WordPress? Please join or consider joining the WordPress accessibility team. The accessibility team provides accessibility expertise across the project to improve the accessibility of WordPress core and other resources around WordPress, such as the Learn program as well. You do not have to be a developer to attend accessibility team meetings or to get involved. There are a lot of things that designers, content writers, uh, people who use assistive technology can do to help contribute to the accessibility team in WordPress that do not require development or coding knowledge. So please do get involved no matter what your role is. You can learn more about getting involved on make.wordpress.com. And finally, would you want to help organize next year? 
we had such fun time as organizers that we have all already decided this is 100% happening again next year. Or actually, I just said that. <laughs> we haven't had our post-mortem yet. But uh, uh, we want to know if you will join us. So if you visit our website, there is an organizer interest form, which you can find below the current organizer bios on the organizer page of our website. We'd love to have you join the team. Go submit your info. And then in a couple of months when we've all had a little rest and we get ready to regroup for 2024, we will send out an email and you can decide either way. But if you think you might be interested, please go fill out that form. Thank you again for joining us for WordPress Accessibility Day 2022 and keep up the great work of making the web work for everyone.